The passage of time is a mystery we like to marvel at. And in our storytelling, we often do so with bullets. One of these bullets is like us, traveling forwards through time. The other one's going backwards. We like to fantasize about freezing, inverting, and traveling time. And we do so because we know that ever since Einstein, physics tells us that time is relative. Well, every hour we spend on that planet will be seven years back on Earth. That's relativity, folks. Now, the conundrum is that Einstein's theory of relativity perfectly describes how time is observer-dependent. But what it does not describe is one of the most fundamental human experiences, namely the passage of time. Could it be that Einstein did not have a clear answer here because he did not take into account mind, consciousness? I'm not claiming that time doesn't exist. I'm, I'm simply saying that time does not flow. This is physicist Paul Davies, winner of the Templeton Prize. In his view, the passage of time and the arrow of time are an illusion. The arrow of time is not an arrow of time. It's an arrow of directionality, of sequences of physical states in time. To grasp this idea that there might not be an arrow of time that somehow transports us from the past via the present to the future, it helps to take a look at a model neuroscientist Julian Mosbridge presented during our conference. Um, we know that it feels like the top where people land on the moon and you don't know what's going to happen next. And then at some point 9-11 happens and then you don't know what's going to happen next. And then COVID happens. And then of course, flying cars, right? We expect that. We don't know if actually that will happen. We have another model, which is this sort of model of, I think similar to what Paul was talking about, where all the events are there, like a landscape of time and human experience is moving across it. Okay, so if the passage of time is actually an illusion of mind, that would mean that consciousness is not in time, but time is a construct in consciousness. Because the question is, is consciousness fundamental? From the Big Bang 14 billion years ago, quarks, nucleons, atoms, biomolecules, cells, organisms eventually produce brains which produce consciousness. That, if you like, is the culmination of complexity. And that's the standard view. But there is another view which says that underlying everything, there is consciousness with a big C. If indeed our brains located in space-time do not produce consciousness, what then is the relationship between our brains and consciousness? Because there clearly is a relationship. There's no doubt that thought depends on the brain. The question is the nature of that dependence. Now, 99.9999% of neuroscientists just don't know about that. There's only one option. The brain is productive. But there's another option, which is the brain is permissive. And this makes a whole different empirical and, met and metaphysical route. This is Alex gomez Marat, a theoretical physicist who became a neuroscientist, and he studies the so-called edge cases of consciousness. So I'm working with a blind man who can see. Right? So what is that? What is that nonsense, Alex? Why don't you do this on Sunday evening, you know? Well, so apparently some people can perceive information that doesn't come through the five senses. To account for edge phenomena like precognition, remote viewing, or something as strange as extraocular vision that Marin is studying, it makes more sense to view the brain as a filter instead of a producer of consciousness. You can wonder if what's going on is that as your brain is becoming less irrigated, sometimes damaged, sometimes doesn't have enough oxygen supply or nutrients, whatever is going on, instead of being a broken computer, because when computers break, they don't create systematic, beautiful, rich, um, amazing experiences, right? So instead of being that, perhaps is that because the filter is being damaged, now more mind can flow through. To see if a filter hypothesis of the brain and consciousness holds any water and how it might relate to our experience of time, it is interesting to take a look at altered states of consciousness. During the conference, neuroscientist Mark Whitman presented his research with a Buddhist monk. 
And we did actually an fMRI study with him and where he got into such a peak experience while uh, in fMRI. And we could show that during this peak state, he had a maximally decreased, there was maximally decreased functional connectivity in the postural default mode mode network, the PCC, which is very much related to the narrative self. So we uh, interpret this as a loss of the narrative self during that uh, peak state. In altered states of consciousness, there is a very interesting correlation between the experience of self and the experience of the passage of time. And in peak experiences, what people report again is no time, no self. This is day two of the Essentia Foundation's Time and Mind Conference, during which some of the brightest neuroscientists, philosophers and physicists present their latest ideas on perhaps that most mysterious relationship in our universe, namely between time and mind. Now it's time to hand you over to the host of our conference, Professor Bernard Carr, who did a wonderful job in navigating this big mystery of time and mind. Welcome to the second day of the Time and Mind Conference. I am Bernard Carr and I will be hosting the meeting again. I will start off by giving a, a 10 minute introduction. And I will not be giving exactly the same introduction as I did yesterday, even though, well, presumably the audience is not exactly the same. Today we've got uh, four more talks and I'll be introducing the speakers before their, their talks. Uh, I would also like to start off by thanking the Essentia Foundation, who are, who are hosting this meeting, Bex, in particular uh, Lisa and Kirsten, who, who are been in contact with the, the speakers and organizing the logistics of it. I also want to thank PJP, which is the group which is actually supervising the, the videoing and, and, and actual recording, without which none of this would happen. And also, I would like once again to thank Bernardo Castrup, who is a friend, but he also in, invited me to, to host and organize this meeting. And it's given me a wonderful opportunity to invite not only great experts on the topic, but also personal friends. So uh, here is the program, which you've already seen from the website. Obviously, we're today focusing on the, on the, the lower panel. I started off yesterday by stressing that time is an interdisciplinary subject which involves physics, philosophy, neuroscience and psychology and indeed parapsychology. And that's really what makes it so interesting because we brought together people who have expertise in all these different fields. Uh, yesterday, we, the focus was mainly on physics. We had three physicists, a philosopher and a, a psychologist. Uh, today we're going to have a physicist, two psychologists, and, and, and one neuroscientist. Now, I, I shouldn't give the impression that those are the only four areas which have relevance to time. I'm also quite interested in, in the insights into time that come from literature. We're not going to talk about that in this meeting, but I'd just like to highlight a wonderful article by Etzel Cardenia on time and writers. And uh, he talks about a variety of concepts, sequential time, disjointed time, suspended time, anticipated time, circular time, reverse time, alternate time, eternal time, end of time. I'm not going to explain what all those different terms mean. I just want to indicate that literature can also give great insights into the topic because all of those concepts arise in literature. Um, he gave his talk, incidentally, in a, in, in a wonderful meeting on the mystery of time, which was hosted by the Baal Foundation just over a year ago. And actually, that meeting was important because that's why I met two of today's speakers. Now, I want to also emphasize that there are other topics which we are not covering in this, in this conference because we only have two days, but I just thought it might be useful to, to highlight these uh, so you can investigate them further on your own if, if it's of interest. First of all, there's a whole link between neurophysics and consciousness. There was a, a meeting on neuroscience needs a revolution to understand consciousness. That was uh, just last 
August, and all those talks are recorded. In particular, we heard a lot about the ideas of Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff that quantum processes in the brain may relate to consciousness. There's also a lot of interest within the field in what is called integrated information theory, which is one model of consciousness. But another model is the global neuronal workspace theory. And uh, Christoph Koch and Guilio Tononi are the people associated with those theories. And we're not going to be focusing on this. Possibly uh, Alex, one of our speakers, will mention this. But, but it's worth stressing, though, because it is an important development if we're thinking about consciousness. In fact, this project, there was a project funded by the Templeton Foundation, $20 million project, which was basically funding a comparison of these two theories by scanning the brains of participants during cleverly designed tests. Again, I'm not going to go into any details, but I think it's important to know about that. And also there's the whole link with information theory and consciousness. And I, I want to highlight the work of Federico Fagin on the hard problem and free will. Again, we're not talking about that today, but it's, it's areas that people in the audience can explore on their own if they so wish. Now, a lot of the discussion today is going to be on consciousness. Remember, the theme is, of the meeting is time and mind, so there's quite an emphasis on mind today. And it's worth saying that there are three views of consciousness uh, among the scientific community. And when I say consciousness, of course, we heard yesterday how consciousness is very much related to mental time. So this is also, if you like, three views of time. The first view is that, in fact, consciousness is in some sense just an illusion generated by the brain. I think we heard about uh, Daniel Dennett's philosophy where the consciousness is where, where zombies. The second view is that it's real but it simply isn't part of physics or, or science itself, physics being a, a, a small part of science, if you like. So in other words, it's, physicists should not attempt to, to expand physics or accommodate it. But there is a third view, and that is that in some sense, physics can be extended so that it does accommodate consciousness. And I have to say, as you may have gathered yesterday, that's my own view, but it's, it's probably not the majority view among physicists. And in particular, I, I want to highlight, I think I showed this slide yesterday, this is the Galileo Commission report, which is advocating a sort of post materialist science where you're using the, the approach of science, but you're, not actually, you're going beyond the normal material world, are you? you're considering the mental domain as well. Um, I myself, I shouldn't be plugging my own approach, but I myself yesterday talked about how you might do that. You're, we know we amalgamate space and time into space-time with relativity theory. We amalgamate matter and mind through observation, which relates to quantum theory. So the question is whether you can have some unification of matter, mind, and space and time, which will would bring everything together. And that's my own personal dream and the dream of many other people. But of course, it's important to realize that if you're going to do that, it will certainly involve an extended notion of, of space and time. In fact, myself and also uh, Jonathan spoke about that explicitly yesterday. Now, I I'd like to say a, a bit about consciousness, because the question is, is consciousness fundamental? Some people think it is. David Chalmers, I propose that conscious experience be considered a fundamental feature irreducible to anything more basic. Is it relevant to physics? It may not be relevant to physics if it's fundamental, but some physicists think it is. It's not possible to formulate the laws of physics in a fully consistent way, way without reference to the consciousness of the observer, Eugene Wigner. Is consciousness produced by the brain? 90% of, 99% of neuroscientists obviously think it is, but here's Stuart Kaufman, a biologist. Nobody has the faintest idea what consciousness is. I don't have any idea, nor does anybody else, including the philosophers of mind. Well, I want to stress a possibility which may not be mainstream, but we have heard references to it. 
Is there such a thing as consciousness with a big C, which is different from consciousness with a little c? The evidence for this comes from various phenomena, which we don't have time to go through, but these are some nice quotes. Emerson, there is one mind common to all individual men, a universal mind. David Bohm, physicist, deep down the consciousness of mankind is one. This is a virtual certainty, and if we don't see this, it's because we are binding ourselves to it. There's a nice book actually by Larry Dossey, which sort of summarizes all the arguments. But if that's the case, if there is one mind, we have the question, well, what's the relation, what's the point of the brain? And in this view, the brain is a filter of consciousness rather than a producer of consciousness. So here's a quote from Aldous Huxley. Each one of us is potentially mind at large, but in so far as we are animals, our business at all costs is to survive, to make biological survival possible. Mind at large has to be funneled through the reducing valve of the brain and nervous system. Now, this, of course, is at odds with the mainstream view, which is that the brain produces consciousness. But I think there is some evidence that, in some sense, the brain is a filter. People have near-death experiences where they, their brains are flatlined, but they're still very conscious and, and even in experiencing more vivid reality. Psychedelic experiences, savant syndrome, terminal lucidity, where people who've suffered from Alzheimer's suddenly become lucid before they die. So this is controversial, but it's, but it's very important. But I just, that's the question, does the brain produce or filter consciousness? And I, I want to focus on that question. It, I think it will arise today. And this is my, uh, a picture I sometimes show, the pyramid of complexity, showing how complexity builds up from the Big Bang 14 billion years ago, quarks, nucleons, atoms, biomolecules, cells, organisms, eventually produce brains which produce consciousness. That, if you like, is the culmination of complexity. And that's the standard view. But there is another view which says that underlying everything, there is consciousness with a big C, the one I. And in that case, that's when you have to invoke the filter theory, saying that consciousness actually is... is the consciousness we experience is just a fragment of that bigger consciousness. I've now run out of time, so that's where I'm going to end my, my introduction. And without any further ado, I now want to introduce the first speaker. And uh, Mark, can I have you? Uh, have you in the screen? Wonderful. Yeah. Mark, welcome. We, you, and also you were here yesterday, so uh, uh, welcome again. Mark studied psychology and philosophy at the University of Freiburg. So you can see how he's bringing together two of our, our circles in my initial slide. And at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. He received his PhD and his habilitation at the Institute of Medical Psychology at uh, LMU. And between 2004 and 2009, he was a research fellow at the Department of Psychiatry in the University of California at San Diego. Since 2009, he's employed at the Institute of Frontier Areas of Psychology and Mental Health in Freiburg. He is the author of uh, two books, Felt Time and Altered States of Consciousness, so he's obviously uh, very well qualified to talk. And I think I already mentioned that I was delighted to meet him for the first time at this meeting in, in, in Portugal last year. So, Mark, I'm delighted to invite you to give your talk, Subjective Time During Ordinary and Altered States of Consciousness. Over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bernard. And you hear me, yes? Yes. Okay, okay, good. Okay, so that's um, uh, what I want to be talking uh, about today. And it's all about time. And first of all, some I will talk about time as the missing link in understanding phenomenal consciousness. And I will talk about some research on the extended present moment experience, which I think is very important here in our context of this um, conference. And then I will <clears throat> talk about the embodied sense of time passage, yeah, giving my theory uh, of how body signals inform us about the passage of time and duration. So the first two things basically uh, relate to if we want to understand, con understand consciousness, we need the time dimension and we need the body, a source um, for informing us about subjective time. 
And I will show how bodily self, the bodily self and time are co-modulated, up and down modulated. And uh, in the last chapter, I will talk about uh, timelessness and selflessness as altered states of consciousness, where uh, time and self might even nearly disappear in peak states. And I will talk a little bit about meditation, flotation rest, and psychedelics. So first of all, uh, I'll uh, talk about um, ideas that Thomas Metzinger has really perfectly summarized and about consciousness, the body, and time. And this is basically the theme I will complement empirically. And so he writes in this book, Being No One, that the bodily self, the cont continuous visceral and proprioceptive input from the body, which is the basis for our mental self, is the functional anchor of phenomenal experience. And then phenomenal consciousness consists of an island of presence in the continuous passage of time related to what is happening right now. So we have the two aspects of phenomenal consciousness I just referred to. It's nowness, the feeling of nowness I experience in the present moment. This is what uh, Thomas Metzinger coined, islands of presence. So the psychological moment is extended. And I also experience as a second part, the passage of time. Uh, and if you put A and B together of these statements by Metzinger, one could say the bodily self is the functional anchor of time consciousness. And I will first now talk about uh, this present momentness and how one could actually uh, work uh, on these on this concept. <clears throat> so the meaning of presence, first of all, is just that the contents of consciousness are phenomenally present now. Now, nowness is inherent in all our experiences. I see, hear, feel, and think at the present moment now. And also, I remember the past and I anticipate the future within this extended window of presence. So the question is, why is the experience present uh, extended? Uh, so and philosophers have uh, dealt with this a lot. And um, one could just say that experience of movement, change, temporal order are only possible in a temporal extended presence. So if we watch a shooting star uh, at the sky, night sky, if you perceive a mel melody, here's mo the motive of Beethoven's Fifth sym Symphony, everybody knows, yeah? um, or spoken language comprehension, it's all integrated into a whole for uh, being able uh, to understand. Or even the duration of the spoken word, now just even this has duration of 200 to 300 milliseconds. And so you have these extension models in philosophy. I just named some philosophers who work with these and meaning that acts and contents of consciousness are temporally extended. And I can refer to uh, one paper I wrote as an empirical psychologist together with Mauro Dorato from Rome, uh, who is a philosopher, where we try to juxtapose uh, empirical research with these philosophical concepts. So this goes back, of course, a lot to Edmund Husserl, uh, where who says in present moment experience as extended has traces of what has just happened, which he calls retention, and what is anticipated, which he calls protention. Uh, but this is all within this window of presence. And uh, a philosopher, Julian Kieverstein, now in Amsterdam, uh, links this time and self very nicely together that through this temporal structure of consciousness, the realization of a self emerges. I become aware of myself through memory of what happened to me and anticipation of what might happen to me. Uh, so it's always time and self. And Husserl interestingly writes in um, his phenomenology, phenomenology of uh, inner time consciousness that the temporal field is obviously bounded, just as in perception. By and large, one can perhaps dare to state that the temporal field has always the same extension. And he even says, but this is not my interest. This, which extension this field has, that's actually in, of interest for the psychologist, like me. So present experience is stressed over time and we as empirical researchers have to quantify uh, this extension and ask how long is actually now. What um, uh, Nordhoff and Lamme, two very important uh, neuroscientists, actually had a very nice uh, summary um, on the different uh, theories of consciousness. So I just highlight here the the three most cited, perhaps the predictive coding theory, the integrated information theory, and the global neural workspace theory. 
um, Bernard just talked about in the introduction. And what I did with Lachlan Kent from Australia is that we did a summary of all these different uh, consciousness theories. And our um, conclusion was that the most dominant theories of consciousness only refer to brief, static, and discrete moments in time, and very few uh, refer to extended, dynamic, and continuous time, which is associated, associated with conscious experience. So time, in this sense, uh, we conclude is the missing link for actually understanding uh, consciousness. So I won't go too deep into different um, yeah, facets of how to um, assess uh, the present moment experience. Uh, actually, it's a quite difficult thing, and there's uh, not so much evidence, but I just highlight some things where I think one could look into, and there is some empirical evidence. So on the right, you see the Necker cube, which was actually prominently uh, highlighted yesterday in, in a few cases. And what happens with the Necker cube, cube with these ambiguous figures is that it switches between two aspects every two, three, four seconds, yeah? naturally. It, ju it just happens to you. And there was the interpretation, for example, by Ernst Pöppel, uh, that this could reflect some sort of our present moment awareness. So, so to say, the brain asks every two to three seconds what's new, and then there's a change. And this could ba basically be reflect this temporal integration level, this present moment awareness. But I think um, the metronome is actually a quite um, interesting uh, paradigm so if you just think about the metronome giving uh beats uh, regular beats one two three one two three these these integrated intervals which which we listen to this one two three one two three isn't there actually physically it's what our brain produces yeah? because the it's the the intervals between the the beats are always the same but still we some sort of put into uh, this physical input uh, this uh, integration of two, three seconds. Why two, three seconds? Because let's say if you if the ISI between these beats is something like one second, you can really still hear one, two, one, two, and integrate them to into a whole. But with three seconds, some sort of it starts to break down, and from one, we cannot integrate to a second beat, and it's still like one. One, one. So the integration capacity breaks together, to, to, uh, breaks down after two to three seconds. So these are some indications of how one could uh, access or uh, empirically assess uh, the present moment awareness. Okay, so this was just like giving an aspect of how one actually has to uh, deal with the present moment experience and is inherently in our perception. But now I want to focus on the second part or on passage of time and this embodiment of passage of time, where I said that the bodily self is the functional anchor of uh, time consciousness. So first of all, just like textbook knowledge, we in, if we're talking about time perception, we have to differentiate between retrospective time perception, looking back. And it's quite clear that um, it's all about memory contents and the amount of changing experiences. So the more uh, activities we have stored in memory over a certain time span, when we look back, the longer it feels. So routine, for example, is a total time killer because there's much, not much to memorize and uh, for, over a certain time span, and then time passes very quickly. So that's qu fairly well understood. Uh, but what is more interesting, I think, is a prospective time perspective, meaning experiencing time at the present moment. Uh, and there, uh, some sort of attention is a, a crucial uh, mediator. So classically, we all know this, in waiting time, boredom, we have attending to time, time passes very slowly. In distraction and pleasurable activities, when we're not attending to time, Time passes very quickly. But this is some sort of the mystery of subjective time because you could ask, so what actually do we attend to if we attend to time? Because it's not a feature of the outside world. And I will give you the answer to this. It's of course the bodily uh, self. So first a little textbook uh, knowledge again. So there is this cognitive model of time perception that maybe there's something like a pacemaker uh, sending out pulse, pulses which are accumulated in this accumulator. And the more uh, pulses are accumulated, the longer subjective duration. That's why eight seconds feels longer than four seconds before, because more impulses are accumulated. But only if we attend to time, these pulses accumulate. So classically, so if we attend to time, waiting for the bus, 
time stretches. If we're in an interesting conversation, we're not attending to time and time passes more slowly because less pulses accumulate. Um, a second uh, modulator is the arousal level. So this pacemaker does not um, send out the pulses at the, always at the same pace, but could be dependent on our arousal level. So if you're more aroused, positively or negative, pulses come out quicker, accumulate quicker, and this also then uh, extends uh, duration. So then next question, where and how in the brain? And I will give you my answers on where in the brain and how in the brain uh, time is processed. And I refer to my fMRI uh, uh, studies I conducted in San Diego um, when I was there for five years. And we had this temporal paradigm. I will just shortly refer to it because I will take it, I will um, use it later again in the second study. We presented a stimulus with a certain duration, then the pause, and the second stimulus appears. And the subjects are requested to press the sec press a button when they think that the second tone is as long as the first tone. So a classic duration reproduction paradigm. And we use three, nine, and 18 seconds tones. And what we found in, in the analysis of brain activity was that in a certain region, the insular cortex, and I will uh, uh, tell you more about this in a second, that we have this increasing activity over time in the insular cortex, which only ends at the end of the time interval to be reproduced. This was for the nine second interval. Here, the same thing for the 18 second interval, that we have this increase in activity over time, which breaks down only around the 18 seconds interval when the tone stops. So increasing activity in the insular cortex seems to be de decoding time. And the question, of course, then is what is the in insular cortex? What is it for? And it's the primary interceptive area. So that's, again, textbook knowledge, which represents physiological conditions of the body. So if you feel thirst, hunger, temperature, pain, that's all signals from the body which arrive in the insular cortex. And the interpretation of physiological states is also the basis for complex human emotions. That's the work, especially by Bud Craig, and also very well now, of course, Antonio Damasio. And we have a lot of neuroimaging and lesion, lesion studies um, where we sh we just shown how the insular cortex is involved in emotions, in complex decision-making, to think about the proverbial gut feeling, in music perception, which has temporal structure, emotion, and also in meditative states, where there's a concentration of the self and the body self. So my working hypothesis was then that the insula is important for the encoding of duration. And when we had beforehand this more abstract uh, model um, of, of uh, time perception with pulses, these abstract pulses, now it could be the body signals uh, as interpreted, which uh, basically accumulate in an accumulator. And it's all about body signals, which define uh, our subjective duration. So time is not perceived in the outside world, by, but through interception by the material self. And this uh, is very much reflected by the phenomenology of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, where he also voiced this idea of, uh, from a philosophical point. So here again, our my model or this general model, well known, and now I just add to, or replace the pulses with these body signals. So it's not just attention to time, but attention to bodily states and increased bodily arousal, which are the two modulators of subjective time. And here again, just looking of, is it the body? So when, if we uh, assess peripheral physiology in the body, do we also get similar results? So this is the same duration reproduction task I just showed you, but now with eight, 14 and 20 second intervals, and what you see here, uh, these slopes, um, increasing slopes, are just the intervals of this duration reproduction task. And what we could show, show is that the heartbeat slows down um, during the interval timing of multiple seconds intervals. So there was even a linear trend that positively correlated with reproduction performance. Yeah? So this, the steeper the slope, the longer duration, uh, the longer reproduction. So that's really fantastic. That means we can just look at the heart rate and the steepness of the slower, becoming slower heart rate predicts temporal reproduction. 
Yeah. So we don't even have to look into the brain, but just looking at the heart, you already can predict uh, time and behavior. So it's all about the body. And so you could say, oh, well, this is this guy, Mark Whitman, and he um, has a theory. But now, 2023, I didn't do anything, but I now get uh, this positive results from two independent meta-analysis with over 100 fMRI studies on time perception. These two different separate groups show the same thing. There's only two uh, brain areas left, um, which are related to time perception. One is the supplementary motor area, which is very much important for sensory motor timing. If we tap, if we move, if the timing of our movements and the bilateral insula, which is an important for interceptive time perception or embodied consciousness. And also actually the insula showed to be uh, related to time perception across all time scales. So this is basically uh, uh, showing uh, uh, complementing my results. So this shows also emotions, body and time are very much related. Now, a lot with this concept, we can understand a lot of hundreds of many hundreds of studies uh, showing that stimuli with emotional content are judged to last longer. Individuals with body temperature, fever, overestimate time. Um, Time passes more slowly when smokers have a physical urge to for nicotine. This was a mean study with smokers that they did. They took them the nicotine away and then had them to judge duration. Surprise, effortful self-regulation leads to overestimation of duration. And also during body-focused mindfulness meditation, when we attend to our uh, self at the beginning at least, subjective time expands. So the hypothesis now... Um, uh, this relation that self-consciousness, body consciousness, and time consciousness are both up and down regulated, and um, um, which I showed already in boredom and waiting times so on everyday time, uh, everyday life, we find this this over representation of time and self during waiting, and in flow states. Uh, when we're absorbed in activity, we find this under representation of time and self. We lose our sense of self and time, and time. So basically, time passes very quickly. So we did a small study uh, trying to quantify uh, what uh, Mikhaili Chikchen Mihaili uh, had uh, conceptualized as the flow experience. And his concept was that intense and focused concentration on the present moment happens. There's a loss of reflective self-consciousness and the distortion of temporal experience. And in peak states, even a loss of the sense of time. And we did this with uh, the game Thumper, and we clearly show that the more flow was experienced as assessed with the qu questionnaire, the faster time passed for those playing uh, this uh, quite dynamic video game. So uh, I will delve now a little into altered states of consciousness. I will talk about meditation and flotation tank mo mostly and a little bit about psychedelics because why because the, there you have at the beginning this intensified self-experience related to a slowing down of time but at some point a switch happens and what you find is then or people report later is that they had uh, this ego dissolution and a dissolution of time and i could have talked could talk about many many uh, other things too. I talked about, I write, write about this in my book, MIT Press book on altered states of consciousness, but I will focus now on meditation and flotation tank. So here, just a, a report by a very experienced Buddhist meditation teacher, Tilman Lundro Borgert, actually whom we um, work with uh, in Freiburg a lot because he's, he's a medical doctor by uh, profession, or but stopped this profession to become a Buddhist monk. And he studied 35 years in a monastery in, in France. And um, just imagine what he did for 10 years. He meditated 12 hours per day. Huh? So this is quite some uh, experience. And I just tried to calculate how many hours of meditation he had across his life. And we interviewed him. And I just read now what he tells about the peak experience during meditation. So the timeless awareness during meditation is an awakening. It has no beginning and no end. The timeless time is an immersion into a being where no comparing happens. When we are comparing, there are always relations between a before and an after. It is timeless presence without the sense of an eye, without observer. Perception and perceiver are one. So non-dual, uh, a non-dual state, no sense of self 
and time. And we did actually an fMRI study with him and where he got into such a peak experience while uh, in fMRI. And we could show that during this peak state, he had a maximally decreased, there was maximally decreased functional connectivity in the postural default mode mode network, the PCC, which is very much related to the narrative self. So we uh, interpret this as a loss of the narrative self during that uh, peak state. So um, just I'll just go over a couple of uh, slides very quickly. So in a study with also experienced meditators, can we more, can we show again this um, downregulation of self and time in um, experienced meditators, you see here, they had something like 19 years of practice, lifetime on average, 3,000 hours, and for four hours per week, they meditated, and they had a self-guided meditation in our coming to our lab, and we compare this with a control condition, you always need a control condition, reading a relaxing passage from a novel in the body posture of meditation. And um, I skipped these slides just to show you what, what happened with subjective um, scales that in meditation, these, these very experienced meditators said that they attended much less to time, they experienced a much faster time passage, and they also experienced weaker body boundaries. So I, I was just talking now always about these very experienced meditators, but luckily there's a method where we actually can also experience similar states like the experienced meditators, and that is through the flotation tank, the flotation rest technique, restricted environmental stimulus technique. And you float in the water at body skin temperature, 35 degrees, super saturated with Epsom salts, and there's no stimulation through external senses, light is shut down, you don't hear anything, you don't see anything. And the initial experience is that you have an increased awareness of time uh, through increased um, interoception. But later, after a while, and they refer to the switch, you get this loss of sense of self and time during that float. And that's why I like to call it instant meditation, uh, because you have this total relaxation and a decreased mind wandering, even if you don't, if you're not a meditator, but just being in this immersive environment. And we just have published now a preprint where you can see all the results in detail. And they basically what I just summarize here, um, there's also a control condition we had to have. So a water bed, also in a room dark room, no noise, and they just lie comfortably on this water bed for the same duration is 60 minutes. And what we showed was that there's a stronger uh, time distortion in flotation rest as compared to bed rest. And the body boundaries, again, are much weaker than in the bed rest condition. Again, self and time totally um, uh, changed. And we also asked the people to estimate duration. What you see here now is in flotation rest for the 60 minutes, they seem to be very precise as related to bed rest, where they had uh, 60 minutes in flotation rest and 49 minutes in bed rest. But this is an artificial mean, what I'm showing here, uh, because people either overestimated or they underestimated. So basically complementing this time distortion, and only an artificial mean happens in of 60 minutes, but still you could say time distortion in flotation rest. And here this just shows that the correlations of time distortion on body boundaries with an altered experience and altered state questionnaire, assessing altered states of consciousness are positively uh, related. So body boundaries and time distortions are features of altered states of consciousness. Here to close this chapter and coming actually to a nearly a close of my, my talk um, is the time distortions on ayahuasca. So if you look at this table, this is by Benny Shannon from Israel, who, who studied a lot ayahuasca um, ceremonies and the effects. So you see the on the left, the parameters and then the temporality in the center. So this is all what we in everyday life, how we in everyday life experience time. And now you see on the right side of this table, the modified temporality, and you see what all happen can happen in experience under the influence uh, of ayahuasca. So the time is totally distorted uh, uh, during um, this, this experience of, of this um, psychedelic. But, and in peak experiences, what people report again is no time, no self. 
Okay, so um, wrapping up. Um, so first of all, I talked about time as a missing link for understanding phenomenal consciousness. And I talk, talked about the extended present moment uh, experience. And then I talked about my line of research on embodied time passage. Yeah? So it's all about the embodiment. Body signals inform us about the passage of time and duration. And that time and self are bodily self are up and down regulated. And this especially so in altered states of consciousness, where we have can even have the peak uh, experiences of no time, uh, no self. And I want to end uh, my talk uh, with Friedrich Schelling, a German idealist philosopher. And uh, it's very difficult to read his work, but uh, I did it and I found, found some individual pearls I want to um, uh, report here. And there's one thing that Martin Heidegger nicely rephrased from Schelling I took over. He said, Night nature opens her eyes in humankind and notices that she is there. And so my paraphrase of this is that when a human being becomes aware of herself, nature becomes aware of itself. So this could be something like this dual aspect monism, you could say we have dual aspects of nature sees itself from inside. And that is our consciousness with small c. And as Bernard said, maybe this also refers to the big c yeah, of nature. And the next thing more related to time is that um, uh, this quote, time is not something that runs independently of the eye. But the I is time conceived in extended activity. This is basically what I wanted to talk about in this uh, in my presentation. So time and self are one. Self arises through proactive and temporally extended activity. That is basically what I wanted to say. And uh, thank you for listening. Mark, many thanks. You've you ended almost exactly on time to, to within a few seconds. Uh, your talk was beautifully clear, and, and I love the way you you amalgamated psychology, philosophy, and, and biolo biology, which is part of the purpose of this this meeting. Um, I, I was particularly fascinated because, of course, in, in my talk yesterday, I was talking about the specious present, and uh, you've given such a, a, a more comprehensive and, and clear discussion of that concept. But uh, I wanted to ask you, because I, in, in my introductory remarks, I made this distinction between the filter theory and the production theory of consciousness, so the brain being a filter or a producer of consciousness. And most of your talk was uh, putting the emphasis on, uh, the, on the body, on, on the material, which sort of suggested that you, were, that you would view everything as being explained in terms of brain processes. On the other hand, I also refer to some phenomena, in fact, so did you, which might conceivably suggest that there's an element of consciousness that goes beyond the brain. So could I just ask you explicitly where you stand on that? Um, <laughs> that's a, a tricky question. So the first easy answer is that I actually already, let's say, transcend uh, the brain yeah, in, in the sense of embodiment. I think that's a very important first step that not too many uh, scientists are doing, but more and more are doing because as I showed is that it's not about the little computer in our head that it's important. That's still some sort of the, the metaphor that people uh, use, but it's all about the whole whole yeah. body. Mm. You know? so the whole body is involved. And it's not, this would be the embodied part. And it's not only the embodiment part, but even this an activist part is that we are basically walking and we're in a world and we're interacting with this world. And this game goes even a step further, yeah, that we as an mm -hmm. as individual bodies interact with the whole environment around us. Yeah? The next, and then we have at least when what I showed with the altered states of consciousness is that we have um, let's say this um way of when I talked about body boundaries dissolving, this is what's just is of course just one side of the coin the other side of the coin is of course you could also say that what people experience when the body boundaries dissolve is that they get one with the world yeah. this goes in the interpretation in the direction of the big c yeah. mm. because what you then have is also can have more compassion with other people that is one step 
or you could get get further and i mean you uh, mentioned it a lot um uh, in the last two days go into this uh, direction of anomalous experiences the paranormal um julia mosbridge will talk about this at the end uh, of this afternoon but even there uh, you could talk about people getting connected through an anomalous way if you want yeah mm. this is of course a very controversial topic but this is something um like a consequence that is of course what we one mm. one should study yeah Okay, thank you. I, I shouldn't monopolize the conversation, but that's a very clear answer and thank you. So we shouldn't talk about the brain filter, it's the body filter in some sense. Now, yes, yes. what I'd like to do, um, I know there are some speakers present, so before letting members of the audience ask questions, are there any speakers present? George, I think you have a question. Uh, so no, George, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. That was a beautifully clear talk, and I think it fits in very well with what I said yesterday. Um, I want to ask something which I think I know the answer, but you will be aware that Robert Sapolsky has recently been make a bit of a stir saying we don't have agency. I believe that your view implies we do have agency. I wondered if you'd like to comment on that. Uh, I mean, of course, we talked about this uh, yesterday also. Of course, we have a sense of free will. So we also, and whether there is free will is a different question, but we at least we have a sense of free will. The same thing is, of course, we also have a sense of agency. And that's very most important for our self-identification, yeah, agency. Yeah? So, uh, and I would go further and say, yes, of course, we have a, self, a sense of agency. And that's part actually of def defining the self. It's not only the embodied self, but it's also the self as agency. Uh, that is important for self-referential processing of knowing who I am. Uh, and that, that works all through agency. Mm. Uh. Thank you. Now, I would like to allow time for at least um, some comments from the floor. Well, sorry, Paul. Uh, Paul, you have a question, I believe. It, it, just very briefly then, uh, uh, Mark, your, your very final comment seems to be uh, an advert for my talk because the quote was that time does not run independently of the I or the self. And I, <clears throat> that's what I'm going to be arguing in my talk a little later on. Okay. Thank you, Paul. We look forward to that. Now, I, I do want to give a little bit of time for a, a question from the, the floor, so to speak. Uh, this is a question, oh, I'm afraid it relates to me too. How does Marx and Metzinger's Island of Presence, conception of the present moment, comport with Bernard's specious present. So I'm sorry, it's Please, that Bernard, me go again. on, it's, it's to, to you, yeah? <laughs> so I presented the Metzinger conceptualization, now you can fit it into your model. Okay, presumably it's the phrase specious present is, is not a common phrase now though in, in the professional field, is that right? Hmm. Oh, everybody knows from William James, everybody knows it, yeah? Yeah. But uh, in the introduction, one uses the phrase specious present, but then one uses other terms too. Thank you. Okay, so, um, well, I, I cannot see actually any more questions from the, uh, from the floor. So, and in fact, it was now just of, uh, 20 seconds to go. So we've come to the end of this session very nicely. Thank you so much, Mark. And Thank obviously, we, we hope that you Thank can you take me. part in the discussion later on at, at the end of the day when there will be a, a, a general panel. I will be here. Panel. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, see you later. And thank you for attending yesterday as well. So now I, I'm delighted to introduce uh, another good friend of mine who's, a, who's a, a neuroscientist. So now we're going to fill in one of those other circles in my introduction. Um, Alex Gomez Marin. He he has a degree originally in in physics, and he has a he did a master's degree in biophysics and a BH, PhD in theoretical physics. But he's con he conducted postdoctoral research at the Center for Genomic Regulation and the Champilimaud Center for the Unknown in Lisbon. Since 2016, he's been a director of the Organism Behavioral Laboratory at the Institute of Neuroscience in, in Alicante, so he's making the link between physics and neuroscience. Currently, he is an associate professor at the Spanish National Research Council and director of the Paris Center in Italy. And in fact, that's where I actually met Alex just a year ago at a conference in, in Paris that was founded by the physicist David Peat. 
his work encompasses the microscopic origin of the arrow of time, animal neuroethology and different species, and artificial intelligence applied to human stupidity. Well, that's very topical. His current research focuses on the scientific study of consciousness in the real world. He is recipient of the first annual Linda O'Brien Noetic Science Research Prize. So, Alex, I'm delighted to ask you to give your talk, The Consciousness of Neuroscience. Thank you very much, Bernard. I won't be using slides. So first of all, my gratitude and admiration, both to Essentia Foundation and also to you, Bernard. First for the foundation, because being currently the director of the Paris Center, I realized how, how difficult and how necessary this work is because universities often are not doing it. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of the, of the efforts that the Essentia Foundation is doing and championing when it comes to thinking about these dif difficult matters. And also to you, Bernard, their friend of mine, and also theoretical physicist colleague. And also one more thing that we have in common and that's been apparent from yesterday and today, I'll make it more, more bluntly open, is that we are coming out of the closet, coming out of the closet of themes that really interest us, that not only are interesting to us, but we believe are important. And, and we need to fight for these, for these freedom, freedom of speech and freedom of thought. Okay, so this is my gratitude. Second, my, my apologies, because I'm probably the, the youngest of the presenters and also the, the least distinguished speaker, but my, my path, is rather eclectic. So I'm a theoretical physicist by training. Actually, in my PhD, I studied the, 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 you could say, the mesoscopic to microscopic origin of the arrow of time. That was fascinating, stochastic thermodynamics, out of equilibrium um, theorems, and it was basically pen and paper. So I'm a theoretical physicist by training, but then I, I'm, I become a neuroscience neuroscientist by chance, and I studied all these literatures for long, but I didn't stay there. And I'm also a philosopher at heart, and lastly, I've become, and still you, pronouncing the para word feels weird, but perhaps I've become a parapsychologist by necessity. So out of all these intersecting circles that you were presenting at the introduction, well, I'm not expert in any of them anymore, but, but, but I work in all of them, or at least at, the, at this tiny bit at the intersection. So that's my disclaimer to begin with. Now, I recall yesterday when I heard Jimena Canales talk um, that we coincided in a meeting actually in, in April last year when we were celebrating the exact 100 years anniversary of this clash, this encounter between Bergson and Einstein. And I had read Jimena's wonderful book, The Physicist and the Philosopher. And my talk then, a year ago, was entitled As With Time, So With Mind. And so when I realized that, I had a feeling of pessimism because I think we're not moving forward and I'll try to make my case. And when we speak about mind, by the way, of course, mind is not the same as consciousness and consciousness is not the same as awareness and that's not the same as psyche and it's not the same as soul or even spirit. And we could spend time disentangling all these subtleties. But when I when we say time or when I say time, I mean, I mean, I will mean consciousness and also subjective experience indistinctly. Okay, so I took note from, again, from what Jimena said yesterday, and she said, the physicist as the spokesperson on questions of time. And when it's so interesting, because of my paths in physics and in neuroscience, that one can swap words and the same formula applies, because one can say that the neuroscientist is usually the spokesperson on questions of mind. So you see, you just change time for mind and physicist for neuroscientist, and the mantra works. But I'll dare to say, that we, I'm going to say we, physicists, neuroscientists, we have hardly anything to say about time. And that's perhaps too, too strong to say in such a conference, but I think we have hardly anything to say about time because, because when, we, when we talk about time, we're not talking about duration, and I must disclose my Bergsonian roots here. And when we're talking about brain, minds, we usually mean what brains do. So... So also from yesterday, you know, Jimena said from Einstein that, well, what a clever move to say, well, time is, what is time? What clocks measure? And what is mind? Again, we can substitute what brain scans measure. But <laughs> again, the question is black box, as she said. So, so we need to do all this 
<laughs> unboxing, and it's tedious work, but we need to unbox all that and stop pretending that we're studying time, at least subjective time, or stop pretending that mind is nothing else but what brains do. Now, Bergson said it very clearly more than 100 years ago, and if you had to summarize his wonderful work, would be time is not space. So the specialization of time betrays the whole issue. And then this magic happens that when you, when you do that, time changes in nature. And we're not talking about time anymore. We're talking about chronos, and I'll come back to this in a moment. And also in neuroscience, the same thing is happening. So let me continue with these parallels. I've been, I've been, and I agree, I've been listening to, to these proposals of extending physics, and perhaps that can come back in the discussion. What do we mean by extending physics? And also in the neuroscience, we're living it because we're working on the extended mind, extending the mind. And the previous talk was a, as a great example of it. You know, it's not just brain, it's the, the rest of the nervous system. It's not just the nervous system. It's what the stomach does, it's interaction, great. Let's bring in, for instance, the lungs, wonderful flesh, bones, embodiment, okay. So then we start talking about the four E's, which is this kind of, kind of heterodox branch of neuroscience, of, of functionalist neuro neuroscience, which is, well, the mind is embodied, um, enacted, embedded, and so on. But I'm wondering, wondering if that's enough. And to borrow that expression from Santayana saying, well, it seems like we, we are spreading spreading here like, like butter on bread. We're extending the mind, you know, after this division of res cogitans and res extensa, which is, which is our foundational wound, I would say. Well, what can we do? Well, we can take res cogitans and we can extend it. So now it's a, it's a kind of a res, res extensa, right? But that's not enough. So we can go back a hundred years and we should, and we should think deeply with help of Jimena about what happened after this clash, the good news and also the really bad news. But also I propose to you now, I want to briefly make you travel 400 years in time, because as it turns out, just a month ago, it was the exact 400th anniversary of the publication of Galileo's The Assayer. This is, a, this is an incredible book. It's a bedrock of science. As a physicist, we don't read it, of course, because we're not taught history of science. Well, we had, the, we had an optional subject in university. I took it, luckily. But go and read Galileo. Go and read Galileo. And this is a letter he wrote, a more than 200-page letter. And... There are so many jewels in them, and I want to mention three jewels. The first one is that in that book, written exactly 400 years ago, or published exactly 400 years ago, let aside the controversy with the Pope and the fact that 10 years after, approximately, of the publication, he was sentenced to house arrest, not to death, but to house arrest, and he actually spent the rest of his life there, and all the, all the, the, the issues that have to do, not just with, with the church, but actually with, with his own peers, um, blocking him. In fact, Galileo wrote the first his first book, I think, a couple of books in Latin. But then, because of the horrible response from academics, we could say, then he decided to write in Italian from then on. All right. So I'm not a historian, so I'll stop here and I'll just mention the three jewels. The first one is that in that book, there's that famous sentence: that "Nature is this book." written in the language of mathematics, which we physicists absolutely love. And it's quite likely true, but perhaps it's not the truth, not the entire truth. And it's this mastery, you know, we can now decode those secrets if we speak the sacred language of mathematics. And that's fantastic. I'll come back to this in a moment. The second jewel is that in this book, Galileo tells to Sarsi, by the way, it's a, re it's a response to Sarsi, who's a pseudonym of a Jes Jesuit who had critiqued Galileo about the nature of some comets that had been seen in 1618. So it's like a long Twitter thread, actually, because Galileo is saying, well, they're, they're just saying what I didn't say, and they're not doing it rightly, and I don't care if a thousand, if a thousand philosophers or physicists, you know, the concept was combined before. I don't care if, if they just appeal to authority of, of Aristotle or their own authority. What counts is the experiment and we can all test it. And that's the end. So no authority and no opinion. We can do it differently. And that's actually another bedrock. Now, the third jewel, and that's the most important for today, is that towards the end of the book, nearly in passing, Galileo makes a distinction between motion and touch. And this will be what later, and I think he's the 
perhaps you can somebody can correct me later, but I think he is actually the first one to articulate that certain things in the universe travel in first class, matter, contact, velocity, the objective world, and other things travel in second class. And he says, well, senses and tastes and all of that have no real existence safe in us. Right? That's the that's the Drake Drake um, man translation. So. What Galileo did then was to programmatically set aside the subjective so that we could progress with the objective. And that's what I'll be proposing at the end of these few minutes. We need to go back to that moment and redo it differently. Okay, so let's go back to the maths. Yes, successful. And I, by training, I, I enjoy all these attempts to unification and all these theories of everything and so on. But that's a view from nowhere. And if you're a phenomenologist, you cannot accept that the ultimate truth about the life, the universe, and everything, apart from being 42, it's going to be a view from nowhere. Because actually, consciousness is the opposite. It's a view from somewhere. So here we have a big problem, despite the great success of physics, despite the great envy of everyone who came after the big brother or the big cousin, which was physics, you know, molecular biology and psychology, and we all pretend we're so objective and even mathematic, plus the uncomfortable realization that most scientists beyond physics do not know mathematics beyond Excel sheets. So, and also, very interesting, they think they speak their own languages because the secret of life is not written in mathematics, it's DNA code, and then for the neuroscientists, it's written in, in spikes, right? So everybody has their own preferred language. <laughs> Now, this view from nowhere, in a way, what it's doing is conflating time with space, or duration is gone. And that's what White had called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. So all these abstractions are necessary. But the problem is that if we don't go back to concrete experience, or if we treat it as second class, then we're betraying the whole endeavor, I would, I would argue. And therefore, that's why we're here, as with time, so with mind. So the passage of time, illusion, free will, illusion, at best, as we heard, sense of free will. Right? Subjective experience, you know, there's even people, very respectable philosophers that say that it's an illusion. You know, it's to me, again, with all with all my 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 hum, humble arrogance, this is nonsense. Second point, I wrote this article called The Consciousness of Neuroscience very recently, replying to more than a hundred really prominent philosophers of mind and neuroscientists who wrote this piece called IIT, Integrated Information Theory as Pseudoscience, right? And somebody pointed to me that fire event. The famous philosopher of science the, the, wrote a piece 25 years ago, 50 years ago, about the same thing, a letter that many people wrote against astrology. And he just came up to say, well, perhaps you're not getting it right. You're not speaking in the name of science. So this is a long story to unpack. But the point here is that the study, the scientific study of consciousness was taboo for many, many years. Of course, people were doing it under the radar in their own way, but it was only in, in the 90s where Crick sanctioned the study, together with COG, with its very pragmatic and mechanistic and reductionistic approach of neural correlates of consciousness. So we've had 30 years after this winter, this is a, this is a, this consciousness winter, this is an expression that coined Eric Hoel recently, after this, conscious, after, after this consciousness winter we've had throughout the 20th century, with all these C's, comportment, cognition, and later consciousness, but now, because of all these internal struggles, using the word pseudoscience within the orthodoxy, this is remarkable. Well, perhaps we have another consciousness winter, and that would be so unfortunate. And there is, and in that piece, it's quite, I would say, I would say it's it's deep, it's caustic, and it's fun. And you'll you'll read what I think is going on with all this rage against panpsychism and idealism and dual aspect monism. It's like all these materialists are revolving, noticing that, that they're reaching kind of this terminal phase. Okay, now, the third point, back to science 400 years ago and Galileo. Most of these theories we're discussing here, to my mind, are still would be still classified as Galilean. They're not post-Galilean. They still embrace, consciously or not, this separation. And whether it's an approach, whether it's an experiment, whether it's a theory on mind and time, it's usually under the idea that the objective has primary over the subjective. And that in some sense, the objective will explain the subjective. Maybe you can say that water is H2O. I don't think so. But definitely, I think you cannot say that subjective experience is something that somehow, and here's the magic trick, emerges from the brain. OK, now, um, just a mention here on theories of consciousness. And if there's time, I'll say more about that. Um, lately, 
despite the, the, the perhaps approaching consciousness winter, lately there's so many theories of consciousness. Like it's it's the Wild West, which is good. But at the same time, there was a quote in a paper, I forgot the author, so apologies, that said that theories of consciousness are like toothbrushes. Everybody has their own and nobody wants to use one and each other's, right? Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, that's true. But most of them, 99% of them, regardless of the ism, and most of them are materialists normally, they fall within the extrinsic perspective. And very few, and maybe integrated information theory is one of the only ones that falls with, within the intrinsic perspective and starts with phenomenology proper. Okay, now, let me mention this quote by Feynman, who said that we should prove ourselves wrong as fast as possible. Prove ourselves, not the other person, ourselves wrong, and as fast as possible, otherwise we cannot achieve progress. So which are ways forward? So I'll point out to some distinctions now, then I'll mention empirical work because after all, I mean, look, I'm a theoretical physicist, but after all, we need to do experiments to test things, and then I'll end up with some reflections. So distinctions. I haven't heard much about Kronos versus Kairos so far, and this is a very this is a very interesting tension, right? Even when you speak about Big Bang and what happened, you know, in the physical world, or if you speak about evolution and what happened in the biological world, and then you play the tape, and then humans, and here we are. And if we, if we have consciousness, whatever that is or wherever it comes, the, the the kind of the chronological approach says, well, there was a time when there wasn't, therefore it must have come out of some magic hat, and that's what we need to figure out. But if you take the phenomenological approach, you realize that you can only speak about physics or biology or life or human life or life before human life and so on from phenomenology, from here now, from your own experience, right? So these two approaches need to be put in contrast. And to realize, so basically what I'm saying is we need to go back to phenomenology. And also, and that's something I would propose now for all physicists and philosophers working on, uh, sorry, physicists and neuroscientists working on these matters and then the rest of scientists, we need to disclosure our metaphysical conflicts of interest. You know, you need to disclosure your 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 money, your, your financial conflict of interest, also your metaphysical, because otherwise we're trying to, we, what, of, what often is the case is that we're putting under the carpet our metaphysical ideology and we're presenting it as data. That's not as fair as it could be. Now, Intuitions about Kronos versus Kairos. Well, Bergson said it and Whitehead said it as well. There is no nature at an instant. So this amazing trick of the delta T made as small as possible, or the fact that throughout my, my, my physics training, this, this letter T was everywhere and bracketed, but, but that's not, that doesn't look like nature. That doesn't look like nature, right? And also, um, so, so time has width. And our experience tells us that. Now we can say, well, whatever, we'll explain it with objective time. But I'm proposing we should also go from the other way around. And also time can be leaky. So if, he, if it has width, it means it's stepping on the past and it's stepping on the future. So therefore, perhaps then the future, a part of the future can leak in the present. Another thing that's very interesting connecting it to neuroscience is that you can think about what memories are. And Bergson reminded us that memory is not just weakened perception, and also, he said, and he wrote this book 126 years ago, Matter and Memory, which all neuroscientists should read, because we've been looking for memories in the brain. We never find them. They're always changing. They're here. Now they're not here. Well, Bertrand says, memories are not in the brain. Memories are not in space. Memories are in time. Therefore, nothing is lost. Nothing lasts, but nothing is lost. And so, for instance, we could ask, when, when to those who study Alzheimer, well, what's lost? Is it the memory or is it the retrieval mechanism? So these are some possible um, further comments I could make on memories, but, but this is, and also for perception when we speak about non-local perception. Okay, another distinction, and I'm so glad that Bernard alluded to it, the distinction between productive and permissive brains, right? And this was by William James, again, 120 something years ago in 1896, he wrote this, this paper on human immortality. And he said, there's no doubt that thought depends, like, like that quote over there, over the, the holder, depends on the brain. The question is the nature of that dependence. Now, 99.9999% of neuroscientists just don't know about that. There's only one option. The brain is productive. But there's another option, which is the brain is permissive. And this makes a whole different empirical and, met and metaphysical route. 
Finally, so I made this distinction, Kronos Kairos, productive per permissive. Let me indulge in, in a couple of metaphysical um, precisions here. Too often, scientists conflate reality with what can be measured. This is scientism. This is horrible. And a more subtle one is that we often conflate, conflate, conflate existence, which actual actuality, which things in actuality. But I think, and I'm not an expert in quantum stuff, but the virtual is also another mode of experience. So I think the virtual and the actual can help us really understand also time, mind, perception, and so on. And not to just make it all collapse into, well, if it's not measurable and actual, then it doesn't exist. Now, empirical work, because all of that has empirical correlates. So, and I call them these, the edges of consciousness. Edges because they're edges of knowledge, they're frontier of knowledge, but also edges because they're marginalized. And this is important to say, because science is not only about theory and data, it's it's a stool and it needs to stand. And the third leg is the social socio political aspects. And, and as, you'll, as you'll notice in a moment, when I mention some of these edges of consciousness, they're systematically um, canceled with all these ugly prefixes, parapsychology, supernatural, right? anti this and paranormal and, and so on. So there's this joke. Here comes the parapsychologist and says, here's the data. And then somebody says, well, it's nice, it works, but does it work in theory? So what does that mean? Here's the data. Well, but it doesn't work in theory, so out. But then there's another joke, which is, well, here's the theory. Now, is it testable? Who cares? It's a cool, cool theory, right? So another caveat here. And the third one is, well, you can present a great theory or great piece of data, and it's difficult, I know. And here they are. And then the joke is, well, you cannot say that. It's not, it's not accepted in our social discourse, right? So this, these three legs need to be on equal footing. And I think that's where the hand of physics and the hand of neuroscience can, can help each other. OK, some edges of consciousness, just mentioned because I don't have time. Well, near-death experiences is a big one. And I actually had a near-death experience myself two and a half years ago. And that was actually what further pushed me from physics to biology and then biology, neurobiology, to, to be concerned and say, well, what, what did I see? Here's the neuroscientist having one of those hallucinations. Well, how much of a hallucination was that? And then if you go back to the predict productive versus permissive idea of brains, well, you could you can wonder if what's going on is that as your brain is becoming less irrigated, sometimes damaged, sometimes doesn't have enough oxygen supply or nutrients, whatever's going on, instead of being a broken computer, because when computers break, they don't create systematic, beautiful, rich, um, amazing experiences, right? So instead of being that, perhaps is that because the filter is being damaged, now more mind can flow through, right? And there's a huge literature of near NDS, and I didn't know, and I started studying it, and I'm pursuing some projects with some with some groups that I can I can detail later. So, by the way, when talking about mind and time, death is the elephant in the room. So I, I leave that I leave the elephant there if you want to come back. More more of these edges of consciousness. Bernard mentioned lucid dreaming on the first day yesterday. Yes, yeah, some people are amazing lucid dreamers. What if this lucid dreaming can have some sort of sense of intersubjectivity? What do we do then? If you can, you know, pass anomalous information, oh, you know, that's that's what? If that can be done scientifically, well, maybe it's a big backdoor into solving these problems. Related to lucid dreaming, we have out-of-body experiences and so on. By the way, related to near-death experiences, we have the phenomenon of terminal lucidity and shared death experiences. There's a lot going on there. Psychedelics is another is another another big field now popular because they found a way to make money out of it and that's why we can study it in universities right but but they, they've known it for millennia and if you have if you've had had one of those experiences well again that display doesn't look like my brain is not working well actually it looks like my brain my brain is working better than any than ever just letting in so much mind another one is mystical experiences and the saints have had them forever more um, edges of consciousness. Well, mind, matter, we know these distinctions are rather uh, um, artificial. Well, mind-to-mind -mind interactions, also, call, also called telepathy, which if you say somewhere else, they look at, well, what are you saying? Are you a scientist? Well, yes, what about telepathy? What about non-local perception, the clairvoyance, right? What about remote viewing or a phenomenon that I'm studying that's called extraocular vision? So these are all fascinating edges of consciousness and of the mind. And I think we need more people. I always joke that 
perhaps there's, there's more money and more people studying the formation of the wing of the fruit fly than studying all of those edges of consciousness together. It's preposterous. Now, some final comments. And as you see, my talk is, is kind of a manifesto. I'm sorry, you know, I, I, I get energized. We need pluralism. And that's why I was saying thank you to Essentia Foundation for what you're doing. We need pluralism, not just epistemic, but ontological pluralism. We need to be able to discuss these isms beyond the true alternative force choice between physicalism and dualism for dummies, which is why we are presented. No, 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 no. There are many more options. And actually, materialism often, of course, if you want to take, uh, take note of these edges, often it, these edges present big, big challenges, not to say that they're almost about to refute it. So that's one, pluralism. So enough of the dogmatic monotheism of reductive mechanistic materialism. Enough, we've had enough, or at least, please set aside, we need more room for other approaches. Another one is, as I said, freedom of speech and thought uh, in academia. And we need to end this cancel culture and, and this kind of censorship. And the, the IIT a pseudoscience letter is, a, is, a, is an incredible example, but this has been going on forever. And well, that's not how science progresses. Actually, this is how science is prevented from progressing. Now, this, this is now I come for, for my, 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 my final recommendation, if I may. So I know because I'm a physicist that we're often seen as being at the top of the food chain. And that's good. And maybe we deserve it because physics has done incredible things, right? But all these theories of everything, they're wonderful, but they're also kind of risible because when I see like the most intelligent people trying to unify quantum mechanics and relativity. And I ask them, well, but what will that tell us about larval locomotion or love? Nothing, nothing. So it doesn't derive, even in biology, by the notion of complexity, even physicists that study complexity, not classical, not quantum complexity, know that you cannot derive this, this, this complexity from you know, the little building blocks. All right, so this is the recommendation. And I think I'll end in time because it's, it's one more minute. Do not ask what neuroscience can do for consciousness, nor what physics can do for neuroscience and everyone else, but instead ask what consciousness can do for science. And so I think what quantum mechanics did a hundred years ago is about to happen in the neuroscience of consciousness, but for it to allow for progress, we need to go beyond Galileo. We need to say, thank you, Galileo. And now it's time to go to a post-Galilean era. So with this, I'd like to thank all my fellow, fellow explorers that I'm discovering when I came out of the closet, um, and also all of you for the invitation and your attention. Thank you very much. Alex, thank you so much. Again, you've ended exactly on time. Uh, I think you're the first speaker who hasn't used slides, but that's actually a blessing because it's been, it's been actually wonderful to listen to your words. And you, and you had so many memorable phrases, which are still sticking in my mind. Uh, the view from nowhere, as opposed the view of, from somewhere, as opposed to the view from nowhere, the edge of consciousness. And I loved your last quote about, think what consciousness can do for neuroscience rather than the other way around. Reminiscence, of course, of President Kennedy's famous uh, speech. And we had the 60th anniversary of his of his assassination only a few days ago. I also love the way in which you brought together history and physics and, and philosophy. Um, and last of all, I would like to say thank you for having the courage to mention some of these taboo topics, which I myself referred to. I, I mean, the P word, parapsychology and near-death experiences. Uh, I, I did refer to this myself, but in, in a rather hesitating way, because I'm always a bit nervous about talking of these things in front of my physics colleagues. But I'm retired now, so I'm putting my head above a parapet. But you're, you're very young, so it's wonderful that you're doing this, even though you're <laughs> just at the start of your career. Anyway, that's enough from me. And I would like to ask, first of all, the, 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 the other presenters, if, if they would like to ask comments, ask questions or make comments. Well, I see no hands raised at the moment, but uh, uh, oh, were you scratching your chin or, or asking a question, Jamina? <laughs> oh, scratching your chin. OK, so we'll go to the floor and then if any of you have questions, just uh, let me know. But here's the first question. 
from the floor, can we envision theories of consciousness that are operational, i.e. descriptive, predictive, as opposed to reductive, so they remain metaphysically neutral and strictly scientific? Ah, all right. Well, metaphysically neutral, impossible. I would say, I would say that's why the, the person who's asking this question should <laughs> disclose the metaphysical conflict of interest. I don't think it's possible, but I, I understand that one can take a very pragmatic approach, not a pragmatic approach in the sense of the pragmatist, but say, well, look, and the same happened in neuroscience, by the way, not talking about consciousness, about cognition or even motor control. You know, you can say, I don't want to understand how the brain works. I just want to treat it. I just want to figure out like an engineer, an intervention that if I'm lucky and clever enough, will just treat, cure the symptom, will eliminate it. And so interventions can give us a lot of benefits, but these are more on the engineering side. So sure. And by the way, the, the Egyptians knew already that, you know, if, if, if a bar just crosses your skull, well, there'll be some problems in, in, in motor coordination, right? So there must be a distinction between intervening and understanding. Now, if, if our goal is not to be like an engineer slash scientist, but more like a scientist slash philosopher, and we want to understand what, what is subjective experience, then no, this, this pragmatic approach will be like cranking the wheels forever. And that's why some prominent neuroscientists that I admire and respect like to water down the heart problem, which by the way, the heart problem is only a heart problem for materialists, uh, which is amazing, right? Because they, then they make money out, out of their own heart problem, but they want to water it down into the real problem, which means just progress, just more mm. money, more years, we'll crank out, we'll figure out more things and they will, but they won't, they won't deliver the promise. And actually that's what I, what I realized in myself and in the students here when they come as neuroscientists, they think they will either help treat disease that will help cure, for instance, what they've seen in their grandparents, or understand the brain. After one year and a half of PhD, they know none of these will happen. They'll just need to just produce papers, get grants, and get in the system. And I know this is the sociological leg of the stool, but back to the theory, yes, the pragmatic approach is good, but it does what it does. So no, no let's not promise more than it, that it can do. And it has happened. I mean, again, I'm not a historian, a human brain project. 10 years, it just finished this year. This, this year it finished, 10 years, thousands of millions, I don't know, billions, it's, it's astounding, right? What did they do? What did they promise? Well, a human genome project, we will grow wings in our bags and so on. We will discover what it means to be human. No, science was done, yes. The understanding promised, no. So it depends what we want to know. I'll stop, I'll stop, mm. <laughs> stop myself. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we have no now a more uh, personal question. You said you were not a quantum physicist. What was your area of expertise in physics? Yeah, it was stochastic thermodynamics. So the question of if you have the laws of thermodynamics and you, have, you, you think about how heat engines work, what happens when you go to smaller scales in which energy fluctuations are of the order of KBT, and therefore, well, you don't have just one measure, you have a distribution of heat production or mm. entropy production, and how can we bridge these, le these two levels between the mesoscopic and the ma microscopic thermodynamics. So that's why I mentioned it was kind of mm. trying to figure out the origins of the arrow mm. of time in, in that regard. But I think that's an interesting question too, because uh, some of us talk about extending physics to accommodate consciousness and things, but physics itself covers many different subfields and, and I think those different subfields can uh, elucidate the problem in, in different ways. Yep. Yes, now, and, and let me just add, I, I am very aware that as a, as a condensed matter physicist or ex-condensed matter physicist, physicist, I'm uh, on the third rank because, because quantum physicists and, and, and high, high energy physicists are, are, are above, above, even, even above the, 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 the intellectual pyramid, mm. right? So, and, and this is very interesting too, like the progress that you see in, for instance, in material sciences and physics, and perhaps the stagnation that we've seen in, in high energy physics now since the, what, 70s, 80s? But nevertheless, there are different pedigrees, like in neuroscience, like, oh, the neurosurgeon mm -hmm. is here, and the person doing the kind of social, pro-social, behavioral work, well, second or third rate. Mm. We, must be, we must be aware of that because, well, again, going back to Jimena Canales' insight of the book and of the talk last year, every time, every time I hear her, it's like amazing. It's like, 
It's not so crucial what time is, but who has the authority to say what it is and who doesn't, right? And so within and without the sciences, there's this difference. And even within the sciences, we have mm. kind of a ranking. Okay, so you need, who need, you need to invite to say what mind or time is. And you say, well, this, this other opinion, despite being an expert, mm. it's second or third grade. Thank you. Um, now we have here a question. Can you tell us a bit about your research on extraocular vision? And I think this relates to the Linda O'Brien Prize that you won. So uh, obviously you don't have so much time, but could you say a little no. bit about extraocular vision work? Yeah, yeah, I'll say it straight away so that it sounds preposterous. So I'm working with a blind man who can see, right? So what is that? What is that nonsense, Alex? Why don't you do this on Sunday evening, you know? Well, so apparently some people can perceive information that doesn't come through the five senses. One needs to do really well experiments, lots of controls, and even that, if one has the data, when the data is presented, somebody will say, but doesn't work in theory. And then you'll say, well, what theory are you talking about? So the, the, the research is about non-local perception, the ability to perceive. And of course, you can do these kind of experiments with, with a sighted person. But of course, if the person cannot see, well, you have, as a, as a joke, you have a triple blind control here. So I could tell more about it, but that's essentially, and you could think of it as in the edges of consciousness, if you think of an archipelago, and there's some islands out there in the north, well, a big island is remote viewing. And, and, and Julia, who comes later, knows a lot about that. It's been studied for many years with some remarkable results, but we don't hear about them. So imagine a small island next to the big island of remote viewing. I think extraocular vision is a phenomenon mm. that's related to that. This ability to perceive something that according to, let me say this, according to a very particular kind of empiricism, we didn't speak about empiricism, mm. which Whitehead, Whitehead calls sunset empiricism. Not radical empiricism like, like William James, for instance, but sensitive empiricism, well, if it's not coming through impacts, through molecular impacts, right? If it's not impacting my, my eyes or my, my, my skin, it cannot happen. But if it does, then what do we do? What do we do? Mm. Do we change the frame mm. or do we cut the picture so that it fits in the frame? Mm. Alex, a, a related question, but answer very quickly, please. To a people who are congenitally blind from birth, can they, do they dream do they have visual experiences in dreams? I don't know about congenitally blind, but I know about people who became blind. And, and the, again, the phenomenology, it's beautiful and, and, and incredible because they, for, they, start, they start forgetting colors. And, and they, in their dreams, I've been told directly by, by this blind man, blind man I know I'm working with, he started dreaming in black and white. And this, this is lost. And then he did some courses on intuitive stuff and remote viewing and lucid dreaming. And then colors came back to the dreams, right? Mm. So the phenomenology, the, the umwelt, mm. the world from the perspective, again, not a view from okay. nowhere, the mm. world from the perspective of these, of these subjects um, is, is it the looks door to okay. study again, consciousness a as opposed to an mm. anomaly. Mm. One final question, because we're running out of time. Could you elaborate on your statement that memory is stored in time? Oh, yes, it's the, <laughs> no, I cannot in, in 30 seconds. But the question of where are memories, where are memories? Well, they sh there should be in the, in the brain. There was a recent article by a neuroscientist that I also admire a lot, David Popel and, and, and the co-author, I don't remember. It was like, we still don't know where memories are stored in the brain. And I would change, how? By weather. We don't know whether they're stored in the brain. But of course, to most neuroscientists, it is unthinkable because of what Bergson told us that we still haven't grasped, that time is not space. So memory is, is by nature a phenomenon in space. Now, if we, t if we try to find it in time, of course we can find correlates. If you hit my head strong enough, I'll forget things. But yes. the question is, well, where did these memories go? Did I, did I erase them or do I remember them? And just to mention one more edge of consciousness in, in 10 seconds, Reincarnation studies, yes, there have been lots of them. How can these people remember a previous life? 
it sounds again impossible. Mm. So we need to deal with this impossible. Mm. We need to deal with impossible theories, impossible data, and impossible social pressure. So that if we want to progress, as Feynman said. Indeed, but I'm afraid we will have to address these impossible questions in, at another time, Alex, because we've now run out of time. But thank you so much for a, a, a most stimulating and, uh, if I may say, passionate talk. Yes, I'm Spanish. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, well, now I, I would like to uh, ask Paul to take the stand. Paul, thank you very much because, of course, we, we welcomed you yesterday, but we're now especially pleased because you're going to talk to us. Uh, a few words of introduction. Paul is the Regents Professor of Physics and Director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science at Arizona State University. Um, he, he's a cosmologist. Uh, in, indeed, I've known Paul in his professional capacity as a friend for, for many, many decades. An astrobiologist and a best-selling author. Um, his research has been mostly in quantum gravity with applications to the early universe and black holes and the nature of time. More recently, he has worked on the origin of life, the search for life beyond Earth, and the deep evolutionary roots of cancer. He held academic appointments in the UK and Australia before moving to Arizona in 2006. He's written over 30 books, including The Physics of Time Asymmetry, About Time, and How to Build a Time Machine. So he's superbly qualified <laughs> to address us. The most e recent book is What's Eating the Universe and Other Cosmic Questions. There's a lot of quirky facts about Paul which I've unearthed, but I'm not going to read through them all. Just to say, for example, he was propelled into science when Margaret Thatcher gave him a star atlas at the age of 16. Well, not everybody is a supporter of Margaret Thatcher, but it's good to hear that something came out of it. Um, he's, uh, he's also uh, has a, an asteroid named after him. Uh, and that's most appropriate. Paul, I won't carry on listing other quirky facts about you, but I'm delighted to ask you to give your talk, The Muddlescape of Time. Well, thank you, Bernard, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be taking part in this two-day meeting. I've enjoyed the other talks immensely. Uh, I'm going to take a slightly different tack. Uh, I should mention uh, that I'm not uh, today talking to you from Arizona, which is where I mostly live and work. I'm actually in a place called Jacksonville in Florida. Uh, and the reason I'm here is I've been taking part in a meeting very different from this one. Uh, I'm working with a commercial organization here trying to design uh, some equipment to detect life on Mars. And so that's the reason uh, that I'm in a hotel room. And I mention that uh, simply because I hope we won't have too much extraneous noise. And if I look a little bit uh, ghostly, uh, it's because I'm sitting uh, with um, uh, just the balcony in front of me and uh, uh, the rather peculiar light filtering in, uh, but I can assure you I am uh, perfectly healthy as far as I know. Uh, but my computer is standing on top of the uh, balcony uh, table, which is standing on top of the balcony chair <laughs> in order to get it at the right height. So I hope the whole lot doesn't come crashing down. Um, so with that little introduction, I will, of course, try and share my screen because I do. I'm going to revert back to a PowerPoint uh, presentation um, and uh, the opening uh, slide. Uh, I should uh, I hope everybody can see that. Um, yes, perfectly. But, uh, of course, stress that that is not me there. Um, uh, so. Um, the, the notion, I think I've given uh, plenty of uh, precursory warnings that I should be talking about uh, the fact that I don't think uh, time does flow, that the flow of time is something like uh, an illusion, or I don't like the word illusion, I think a metaphor, uh, which is uh, sometimes misused is a, a better way of putting it. Um, but of course, uh, this idea of the river of time or the flow of time or time passing uh, is so deeply embedded in our culture that uh, to, to make the claim that this is somehow wrong-headed uh, is always a challenge. And here I've just plucked a couple of quotes, one uh, from a, a poet uh, and one from uh, a scientist uh, penned at about the same time. Uh, but at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near, that's Andrew Marvel. Uh, and Newton was explicit, absolute time flowing equably without relation to anything external. 
Uh, so uh, this is, uh, as it were, the default position for most people, that time is something that passes or flows or runs. And all of these words have been much in use in the talks that we've heard yesterday and today. Uh, and I'm going to take the point of view that this is uh, uh, really a very bad way of um, uh, trying to, to analyze time. Although that uh, uh, rather to jump to the conclusion that this is an aspect of time that more properly belongs to neuroscience and uh, psychology and not to physics. That's going to be my position. So time does not pass. The flow of time is an illusion is my central position. Uh, of course, this is not a new position. Uh, ph philosophers have long had a tradition of questioning this. Uh, this is a famous paper by Donald Williams, The Myth of Passage. Uh, I really learned most of what I understand about the nature of time from reading uh, uh, Adolf Grunbaum's uh, book uh, and also from Jack Smart, J.J.C. Smart, the Australian philosopher who was very explicit uh, and also admonished people who would not make a distinction between time asymmetry and the flow of time. And I uh, want to unpack those two. Uh, Bernard was kind enough to mention my book, uh, The Physics of Time Asymmetry, my first book, uh, which was uh, written in the mid 1970s. Uh, it, it emerged from really from my PhD work. So I've been in this uh, time game uh, since actually the late 1960s, so 55 years or something, uh, which is uh, in itself a rather uh, de depressing uh, fact, I think. Um, so I just want to, uh, I, the title of my talk is The Muddlescape of Time. And part of the reason that people get confused and uh, disputatious on this subject is the muddle of the terminology and the muddle of the concept. So it's called the muddlescape of time because I'm trying to uh, separate out very different things. And uh, you will see uh, occasionally popular science articles like uh, this one here, you know, time might not exist. Um, I'm not claiming that time doesn't exist. So people often leap to this conclusion. Uh, I'm, I'm simply saying that time does not flow uh, or run or pass. Now that's not the same as saying that time itself is an illusion. And this came up briefly yesterday uh, with the mention of the work of Julian Barber, who does indeed claim that time uh, does not exist. And so there is uh, a, a strand of thought that comes out of the field of quantum cosmology, where the time parameter drops out uh, if you believe in a quantum description of the whole universe. I'm not sure I do, but uh, some people do. Uh, and that's a separate topic. Uh, that's an interesting topic. I'm not talking about that. Uh, I'm not saying time does not exist. Time certainly does exist. So that's not what I'm talking about. Um, various de definitions. My favorite one is time is just one damn thing after another. Uh, then uh, Augustine, uh, often quoted, uh, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know, but if he wishes to explain it to someone, then he doesn't know. I think that reflects uh, our own confusion that time is something we we feel internally, but it's really difficult to articulate. Uh, it's a bit like trying to explain what is it like to be me uh, to somebody else. Um, but I'm going to take this austere physicist definition that time is the duration between events. It's what clocks measure. So it certainly exists because clocks exist and they measure durations. And so uh, I'm doing what our previous speaker ad admonished against, which is I'm uh, really spatializing time. I'm saying that uh, clocks measure durations uh, between events and rulers measure uh, distances between points in space. And uh, they are very closely related. Indeed, uh, they are unified in Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, where we talk about space-time, the four dimensions of space-time, and uh, that that gives us this uh, sort of spatialized uh, uh, picture. Now, this will be familiar to people from earlier talks. Uh, this is the um, the, the uh, attempt to describe the unification of space and time within the theory of special relativity. And what you're seeing here is the so-called light cone. It's got a cone-like structure if we suppress one dimension of space. And 
uh, as uh, George Ellis discussed yesterday, uh, that if uh, you uh, try to define simultaneity, what's happening at the same moment uh, as, uh, as now, uh, say on Mars, uh, that the event on Mars that is simultaneous with uh, now, this moment, uh, will differ by up to 20 minutes by uh, depending on exactly how uh, the, the observer is moving. Uh, so time, as we say, is relative. Uh, now, George argued uh, that uh, in spite of that, which is true of local physics, uh, that when we come to cosmology, there is a sort of privileged reference frame. And that reference frame, incidentally, is very easily thought of uh, that the Big Bang uh, that uh, created the universe 13.8 billion years ago uh, filled the universe with heat radiation and that fading afterglow is around us everywhere. Uh, it, um, uh, it, it's uh, isotropic, it's, that is, it's uniform across the sky, the temperature is the same over there as over there, uh, and, uh, uh, and so that defines a particular reference frame. So if you say uh, that the privileged observer sees the uh, heat radiation from the Big Bang to be the same in every direction, that is a particular reference frame. Turns out that our planet, uh, the Earth, is not actually uh, sitting in that reference frame, it's moving relative to it, but it's moving fairly close, uh, fairly uh, slowly compared to the speed of light. And so uh, that's the reason that we can talk about the age of the universe in this precise way. It's the age as told by a clock sitting in this privileged reference frame. Uh, and so it gives us a, a type of sort of privileged time. And that's fine. That's good uh, for cosmology, but I don't think it's good for uh, local physics. So, for example, a proton in the Large Hadron Collider whizzing very close to the speed of light. Uh, if you ask that proton, what's the age of the universe? It would give you a very different answer from the 13.8 billion years that, uh, that I just gave. Uh, so that's just really a passing comment because I have other things I'd like to say. Um, and so uh, the, these quotes uh, have been given many times. And so I'm, I'm uh, going to, not going to uh, waste too much time on it, uh, but it does lead to this notion of uh, what's called block time. I prefer to think of that as the timescape. That is, just as we have a map that you can unfurl that represents the landscape and it's all there at once, uh, so uh, we can unfurl a map uh, between the of all moments of time, call that the timescape. And if we have a four dimensional view, then, then it's the space timescape. Uh, so I, uh, that's the way I prefer to think of time. Um, but uh, nevertheless, we get, we continue to get these uh, confusing claims, like could time run backwards, uh, which is nonsensical at many levels. Uh, but in particular, the point I'm trying to make at the moment is that it doesn't run at all. So this is an abuse of language. Uh, if uh, you simply ask, uh, this came up yesterday, uh, well, uh, if you think time passes, uh, what is the speed of time? Uh, uh, you, we can talk about, I'm looking out at a river here in Jacksonville, and the speed of the river is probably about half a meter per second, taking a careful look at it. Um, what is the speed of time? Uh, well, of course, it's one second per second. It doesn't tell us uh, anything, anything at all. Um, we've had some discussion about the specious present and uh, and the, um, the width of the present moment and uh, what is it? Uh, I mentioned yesterday that I uh, met once met Miroslav Holub, who wrote um, the dimension of the present moment, uh, who claimed that in music we have to really take into account a sort of sliver of time, which might be longer than a second. But uh, there's this amusing quote that I always like to use. Harold Macmillan, the former prime minister uh, in the UK, spoke of uh, Foster Dulles, the US Secretary of State. His speech was slow, but it easily kept pace with his thoughts. So of course, uh, we cannot separate our, uh, our understanding of time from uh, what's going on in our, in our brains. Um, so to cut to the chase, uh, what I'm arguing here uh, is that this myth of time's passage comes about because of a fundamental confusion 
that people uh, feel that they have a fixed personal identity. Uh, you know, I'm Paul Davis. I always was Paul Davis and will be, I hope, till, uh, till I die, uh, that I'm a fixed person. And so, of course, the world appears to be changing around me all the time. I think this is simply back to front. Um, that uh, the time is all laid out there, that what is changing is, is me. It's the I of personal awareness. Uh, I'm not the same person moment to moment. Of course, I'm very similar. So Paul Davis today, Paul Davis yesterday, has a lot of what physicists would call mutual information. Uh, but to assume that that means I am the same person uh, is the source, I think, of this confusion. And it uh, was nicely summarized in uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I could tell you my adventures uh, beginning from this morning, said Alice timidly, uh, a, a little timidly, but it's, uh, it's no use. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, actually, can't read this because I've got to try and get the uh, off the screen. Uh, well, look, you can read it for yourselves, I think. Here we are. Uh, but it's no use going back to yesterday because I was a different person then. Um, so that uh, summarizes it very well, what I'm trying to say. Now, I think that there's an analogy here with uh, uh, with uh, giddiness or dizziness. Uh, so if you uh, stand up and twirl around quickly, like this ballerina, uh, and then stop, you have this overwhelming impression that the universe is rotating. It seems to be moving. Uh, but of course, it's not the universe that's rotating. It's fluid in your inner ear. Um, so it's illusory in that sense. I mean, it's a real phenomenon. So uh, illusion is not a good term, but it's uh, it's it's getting things back to front. It's what uh, the impression of motion is something in your head, uh, not something in the external world. And I think the same is true of the passage of time. Um, now, uh, some people, again, get confused. They say, well, am I claiming that there's no arrow of time in the world, that, uh, that the past and the future are not distinct? And that's absolutely not true. Um, and uh, the world is asymmetric in time. Uh, my book, The Physics of Time Asymmetry, is all about that. The physical processes have this directionality uh, towards, usually described as towards greater entropy or disorder, very easy to give examples. Um, this is the second law of thermodynamics. You open the great book of nature and it's very near the front. That basically order tends to give way to disorder. This picture uh, tells it all. We don't often see the wreckage from, uh, from earthquakes uh, reassembling itself into ordered uh, structures. Or another favorite example, the egg in the kitchen rolls off, breaks on the floor. We don't see eggs uh, spontaneously reassembling themselves. And these things, uh, oh, another another example, um, that if you uh, uh, put the snowman, I, we have to call it snow person, I suppose now, uh, near to the fire, then you would expect uh, that the snow person would uh, diminish, uh, would heat up and melt, um, and it wouldn't go the other way. You wouldn't find that the fire would, would be raging even more strongly and the snow would accumulate on the figure there. So these are all examples of the directionality of physical processes, and this is real. And I think, uh, you know, it's not connected with uh, this idea of the flow of time. It means you can assign an arrow of time. That's fine. But the arrow metaphor has got really muddled because um, the uh, it's an arrow of, um, the arrow of time is not an arrow of time. It's an arrow of directionality of sequences of physical states in time. It's not an arrow of time itself. Time is just sitting there. Uh, it's uh, the way in which we order a sequence of events. Let me just give you another example. Suppose you take a movie film of an everyday scene uh, and then you play it backwards. Well, everybody laughs. Uh, it looks so preposterous. Uh, and that's because we're familiar with this idea of a directionality, an intrinsic directionality of events. But now, uh, if you take the movie, if it's an old fashioned movie, uh, and you chop it up into frames and you shuffle the frames and give it to somebody and say, put those back into order, uh, then most people would have no difficulty in doing that. Uh, and you'd have a stack of, of frames like this. Uh, and uh, that stack has an inbuilt directionality, an inbuilt asymmetry. There's a, a frame corresponding to the beginning of the sequence, frame corresponding to the end of the sequence. Uh, 
And that is something which is uh, fixed statically in that stack. Uh, you don't have to rejoin the frame to run the movie to make the point. It's a structural property of that stack. You don't have to run the movie. Um, so this is where uh, I'd like to clarify the distinction between the two notions of the arrow. So when people talk about the arrow of time, a lot of people are thinking that this is uh, like an arrow flying through the air. That's one uh, one use of an arrow. Uh, so the arrow is flying. But we also uh, use the arrow uh, metaphor or symbol in other contexts. For example, uh, when you have um, a compass needle. A compass needle is an arrow that points north. That doesn't mean you're moving north. It's indicating a an asymmetry in space between north and south due to the spin of the Earth. It's an asymmetry in space. And in the same way, the arrow of time refers to an asymmetry in time, not of time. We don't say space is flowing north or anything of that sort. Same thing with a weather vane. It uh, points the direction of the wind, not the velocity of the wind. That's You need an anemometer for that. Um, and. Uh, in case you're not still not convinced, let me just uh, put this to you. Uh, how would you know uh, uh, when you wake up tomorrow morning, uh, you expect it to be tomorrow, but supposing you woke up and you were five years old, uh, complete with all of your memories of five years and with everything subsequently wiped out. Uh, you simply are returned to where you were at the age of five. How would, it, how would the world be any different? And then supposing you could go the other way. Suppose you fall asleep tonight and you wake up one year from now. Uh, how would you know? You've got all the, the memories of uh, the intervening years. And supposing your time experience hopped around like this, maybe 10 times a day, back and forth, uh, randomly across your world line, your extended life. How would anything be different? Uh, and I think it wouldn't. And so that's another good way of seeing why time itself is not uh, as it were, conveying you into the future. And talking about time itself, one of the great um, the defects about Zoom is that I've never found a way of keeping a clock on the uh, on the screen uh, so that I know how well I'm doing with time. And I took the trouble uh, to prop up my iPhone here uh, by, by the um, computer and put the stopwatch on and look what's happened. You see, the screen has just gone blank uh, and I... I checked earlier on uh, with the, um, uh, uh, I went to the internet to see is there a way of keeping uh, the screen alive and no, the, the answer is not on my iPhone. So I've now restored it, I see I've been talking for 22 minutes uh, and so uh, I have a little little bit to go but not too you, much. You have 16 time. minutes including the question time, Paul. Yes, I realise that we should allow time for questions. Um, uh, so um, uh, I'd like to summarize in this chart what I'm saying. Uh, there's an arrow of time, and this is, as it were, an arrow of entropy, uh, that we can imagine uh, that a, a human being like me, I'm extended uh, through uh, time. So that's the vertical arrows on the left. And at each moment, I have a mental state, M, and then M1, M2, M3, a sequence of mental states. And these mental states correspond to states of the world. Uh, I, uh, mental state of, of me at this time is uh, corresponding to being here in, uh, in uh, Jacksonville in Florida, but uh, a mental state of me tomorrow will correspond to me being, I hope, if I get back right, um, uh, in uh, Arizona and so on. I think you can see the point that our mental states, uh, they're correlated with our brain states, but just uh, briefly our mental states uh, correlate with the states of the world. And each mental state and each state of the world, we, we could say now, uh, but we're just labeling the times, uh, T1, T2, T3. Uh, nothing's moving or flowing. It's just that later brain states, later versions of the, this uh, self called uh, Paul Davies are correlated with later states of the world and later uh, points on a clock. And, and that's all, all there is. It's a mapping. Uh, from uh, states of the world into uh, into mental states. And M3 is slightly different from M1, as I've explained. Uh, not very much, 
so that we have memories which connect M3 to M1, a lot of mutual information, but slightly different. Uh, the world is slightly different and the times are slightly different, but nothing's flowing or moving. It's just such a complete description of, of what uh, we experience. Of course, it would be very cumbersome to go through life without making reference uh, to this uh, psychological and mental phenomenon that time is flowing. And we use it just like we use uh, notions of free will and agency, which also can also be contested as to you know what whether they're a property of the world or a property of the minds. So I'm not decrying what the previous speakers have said in connection with our experience of time, uh, but I think that properly belongs in neuroscience. I'm not an, an expert, but I assume that there are aspects of neuroscience having to do with the laying down of memories and so on uh, that would uh, would go some way to explain this, why we have this sense of temporal flux. Uh, but in the same way that I would look to neuroscience to explain uh, our sense of temporal rotation when we feel dizzy. Um, I uh, don't have enough time to, to properly deal with the source of this time asymmetry. It's come up in some of the earlier talks. Um, I believe it's ultimately a cosmological phenomenon. Uh, we see very clearly it's a good example of the second law of thermodynamics. The sun won't go on burning forever. It's using up, uh, I took the trouble to compute the uh, in dollars what the sun is uh, squandering, so to speak, every day, um, uh, every second. Uh, and of course, uh, eventually its fuel will, will run out and it will die. And so uh, we live as, um, uh, as has been known since the 19th uh, century uh, in, in a dying universe. So these famous words of Lord Kelvin here. Uh, so um, we look out in space, we see stars uh, being born, stars dying, but it won't go on forever. The whole universe is on a one-way slide to a state of um, maximum entropy or the final heat death of the universe, as it used to be called. There's an entire field of cosmological es eschatology, I should say, uh, about exactly how the universe might end. I don't have time to get into it. Uh, except to share a humorous story. I was once giving a lecture in New Delhi on the end of the universe. They asked me to do that. And uh, by a strange coincidence, the lecture took place at exactly when the Mayan calendar uh, was going to um, uh, predict, well, it was being predicted that this meant the end of the world. And so I was able to say, well, uh, I don't believe that this, uh, in this uh, prediction, but uh, before the end of my lecture, we should know the answer. Um, so all of this is a roundabout way of saying that the universe began at a low entropy state. Um, and uh, we and I'm going to skip over this because I just want to make a final point. I'm going to skip over my explanation for the gravitational smoothness of the early universe. It's a fascinating topic. It could come up in question time. But because I want to make a final comment, um, I'm skipping over all this. Uh, wanted to make a final comment about uh, the nature of consciousness because that's been a feature of the discussion so far. I'm arguing that uh, I, I am that it's wrong to think I am fixed and time changes. It's the time is fixed and that I change. But what is this I? What is this uh, sense of self? And uh, I want to just make contact because it's come up a few times with uh, Roger Penrose's idea of uh, quantum mechanics and consciousness that maybe. Consciousness uh, causes the so-called collapse of the wave function. It turns um, put, uh, an amalgam of possible worlds into a concrete actual world uh, through some processes in the brain. Um, I don't personally believe that, but uh, I should mention uh, that it's, uh, it's possible uh, that uh, quantum mechanics breaks down at some level of complexity. And that's what I would like to argue, uh, that, uh, that quantum mechanics is fine for atoms and molecules, not so good for cats and human beings, and somewhere between atom and cat, uh, that uh, something else kicks in. Uh, and it uh, is entirely likely uh, that, uh, also if we are thinking about the nature of consciousness, that that, that has something to do with complexity. Uh, and so uh, what we might have is that uh, there's some underlying mechanism, I'm just calling it X, which explains consciousness, but also explains the collapse of the wave function.
So consciousness is not explaining the wave function collapse. X is explaining both. Um, uh, what is X? Well, one contender is integrated information theory, which has been mentioned already, which has to do not just with the amount of complexity, but with the number of feedback loops and so on. Um, I don't think it, uh, that is the right theory, but it's a good try, good first try. Uh, and so uh, uh, the last word I'm going to leave you with is, of course, what we want is, uh, is to know um, what X is. Uh, I'm saying quantum mechanics is really just an effective theory that breaks down at this level of complexity. And there's this uh, true theory of consciousness. And we want to know uh, if X explains consciousness, it explains the illusion of a flowing time. What is X? We need some clever student uh, who is going to tell us that. Uh, and I can't compete with George, whose paper came out uh, more or less the same day as he gave his talk. My paper came out a few days ago, The Muddlescape of Time. So if you want to know more, this could be found in the journal Timing and Time Perception. Uh, and I run 30 seconds over time, I think, by my little clock here. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Paul, uh, thank you so much. And, and we're, you are welcome to have the extra 30 seconds. Um, I, I'm glad you, 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 in your, with you, you showed your last slide because, of course, there is a distinction between saying consciousness collapses the wave function and saying that the, it's the uh, collapse of the wave function which makes consciousness. And that's Penrose's view, the latter one. So the way you merge them, I think, is rather nice. Um, I, I, there are many comments one can make about your talk. I, I have to say I love your initial definition of time. Time is one damn thing after another because it, it, it brings in the mind element, you know, irritation being a feature of mind. Um, I, I wanted you, I, I maybe shouldn't ask this question, but I, I was fascinated because, of course, you take the view that time is okay for neuroscience and, and psychology, but it's not part of physics. Right. Were you swayed even a little bit by the sort of idea that I presented yesterday that you do need some extra dimension to describe mental time? And I sort of related that to brain cosmology, which is at least an attempt to use physical language to explain it. So were you, you can be as rude as you like, but I mean, were you swayed a little bit by that? Uh, uh, yes. Um, I, I think I said yesterday that I take mind seriously and mental events seriously. Uh, and uh, I'm open to the idea that we should extend uh, physics to incorporate uh, mental events. Mm. Uh, and I've also spent a lot of time talking to Don Page, who I'm sure you know. Yes. Uh, a f former postdoc of Stephen Hawking, and your careers have overlapped a lot. And, and Don. Uh, uh, has his own particular view about the nature of quantum mechanics, the many worlds formulation, and how you fit mental events into that. Mm. Uh, and so uh, I'm very open to those ideas. So I suppose I've been, I've tried to be a little bit controversial in what I'm saying. I think I'm saying that uh, within our current understanding of physics, uh, that time doesn't pass or flow or move. Uh, the arrow of time is not an arrow of time, it's an arrow in time, and that's as far as we go. But if we, but I'm certainly open. I've always been to the idea that if we extend physics to incorporate the mind in some more comprehensive way, then sure enough, we may uh, actually find that there is something that uh, defines this uh, this flow. Mm. Uh, I'm completely open to that idea. I just think oh. we're a long way from it at this oh. time. Well, thank you. That's that's uh, that's great to hear. <laughs> so now again, I will offer first of all a chance for a comment to to the other speakers. Oh, oh, and I can see Julia there too. Hello, Julia. Welcome. Thanks. A special yeah, welcome uh, to Julia because in California it must be some very ungodly hour. So, what what, what is your question, Julia? Yeah, um, Paul, I'm a huge fan, especially of this idea that it's not time that's moving. Um, and I, whenever I've read your work, I keep coming up against this and maybe I just misunderstand it, but you say that the I is that which, the I is the, what is changing, right? I am changing. How do you do change without, how do you do change without time moving? How do you, how do you conceive of that? Right. So I uh, it was a great pain to point out I'm not denying the existence of time. There are earlier moments and later moments and later versions of my mental state. You remember the diagram with, you know, M1, M2, M3. 
um, are different slightly from earlier versions. And uh, and so we would describe that. I mean, if I say I changed my mind, uh, what it means is that my mental state at a later time is slightly different from at an earlier time. And I'm just right. saying. So when, but when you talk different. about that, it feels like you're switching between sort of without saying it, you're switching between a personal view of time and sort of a God's eye view of time so that you can say, look, I see the change from M1 to M3. And that you're looking from a God's eye view, sort of. Right, um, right. That's what physicists do. You know, they we, right. we, we see ourselves right. as a second next to God. <laughs> we take a God's eye view. Of the right, universe. but it feels like if you don't acknowledge that switch, then there's something missing about the explanation. I don't think you get to go, even if you're a physicist, from this personal experience to this God's eye view without explaining that in the physical reality you're trying to explain, I think. Um, well, I, I'm just swapping the, the two positions. I, I'm not denying that uh, that there is um, a change. I'm saying that the change is uh, in personal identity, uh, uh, which correlates with the world. And it's not it, it if if you think that you are a fixed or conserved entity, you as a self, then of course it seems like the world is changing around you, and there's a sort of temporal flux. Uh, but I just think that's back to front. Um, that that we mustn't think of ourselves as conserved. Mm. We're evolving all the time, uh, and um, uh, and I think that just resolves the issue. Mm. So uh, the, the the whole. I, my talk is the muddlescape of time, and I just think there is these, these, you know, this muddle of terminology. It's a, it's to talk about time flowing. It's a, it's a, a metaphor. Uh, it's a, an attractive one. We use it all the time, uh, and it's there in literature and uh, and art. And uh, we we mm. we uh, and I've, I've, it's nothing nothing wrong with using metaphors. You have mm. to understand it is is a metaphor though, and it's not a property of time. Well, Paul, we, uh, it may be a metaphor, but we are running out of time now. Do you, uh, do you have a question, Mark? Yeah, yeah. Yes, please, um, please uh, ask just, it. Just a short question, sir. First of all, I think you just mentioned in the answer to Julia mentioned that it's not just I change, but everything changes. Yeah, the world is change. Yeah? Ah. Uh, but I, but I want to just ask, ask uh, when when you were open to ideas of merging physics and uh, consciousness, yeah. Um, just to comment on what is the now for physics, then perhaps in relation to uh, experience of, of uh, present moment, as I said, in experience, it's an extended present moment. But of course, in physics, then it's it's a extensionless point in time. Yes. So that would be probably a problem in <laughs> putting these two together. Uh, yeah, well, not really. Um, uh, we talk about split seconds and so on. We have uh, equipment that uh, could go beyond human senses and uh, measure intervals of time uh, down to about a trillion trillionth of a, of, of a second. Uh, there are physical processes in particle physics, 10 to the minus 24 seconds. And as was, I think Bernard mentioned yesterday, uh, that if you go down to the so-called Planck time, uh, it looks like the very nature of space and time break down. Uh, and that most of the people I talk to in my uh, profession uh, seem to think that both space and time, indeed this unified space-time, is an emergent phenomenon uh, that is not itself primitive and that it's built up out of something else. Uh, as an old idea, when it comes to time, people talked about chronons um, uh, as if, uh, you know, the sequence of events in the world might be a little bit like the movie I was talking about, Frames. Uh, I like to think of it as space-time being pixelated. And I'm actually working on, you know, could we detect that? What is a... Is it possible that a photon traveling right across the cosmos might be jiggled around a bit by that pixelation uh, in both mm. space and time? Mm. And so that's a, an idea that's possibly testable. Paul, but certainly, uh, it's, mm. uh, uh, our senses are much too crude. Mm. Uh, yes. Paul, I, uh, I, I would I, I'm going to allow a, a, an extra minute because you started a minute late. Um, and I want to get yeah. at least one question in from the floor. Right. Uh, isn't the notion of entropy too ambiguous to ground an objective arrow of time? There are countless conceivable points of view from which what is disorderly for us could in fact be more orderly, e.g. hash tables. How to define order unambiguously? So it's a quite a technical question. Yeah. 
Uh, it, it is, and it's a very good question because, of course, the, the entire branches of science where people argue over definitions of, uh, of entropy. Um, and there's a famous story about Claude Shannon, uh, who d developed what we now call information theory and came up with a quantity uh, that um, looks very much like entropy. And, uh, and according to the story, asked John von Neumann, well, I've got this thing, you know, what am I going to call it? And he said, well, why not call it entropy? Because nobody understands what that is anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, of course, it's a matter of uh, definitions. There are other arrows of time. Uh, we see radiation, uh, uh, your, your radio uh, signal arrives after it's sent from the transmitter. Um, we see uh, energy flowing out into space from the sun, as I've explained, and uh, we see the universe expanding. Uh, and so on. And there are a number of uh, attempts to link these different things together. Um, but it would be wrong to suggest that uh, that we fully understand uh, the nature of entropy when it comes, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, small numbers of degrees of freedom and so on. It's a very active area of study. Thank you. Uh, and I should stress, of course, to the audience that we've got a, a panel discussion at the end of the day where some of these topics can be discussed at greater length. Paul, thank you so much. Uh, you, you've talked about the muddlescape of time, and I think we're certainly less muddled now than we were before your talk. So well, thank I hope you. so. I haven't muddled you even. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Muddied the waters of the river of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, now it is my great pleasure to introduce, in fact, the, the final talk of the meeting, uh, Julia Mossbridge. Julia has not only got up to give a talk at seven o'clock, but I think she's actually been here since the beginning of this meeting. So you must have been up since about uh, at three o'clock. So thank you so much, Julia, for joining us. I'll say a few words about you to begin with. Julia is the founder and research director of the Mossbridge Institute and a visiting scholar in the psychology department at Northwestern University, a fellow at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, the science director of Focus at Will Labs and an associate professor in integral and transpersonal psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies. So she has many strings to her bow. Her, her focus is on teaching and learning love and time. Love is something we haven't heard about at this meeting so far, so this is appropriate. Uh, leading projects, conducting research and coaching technology executives and engineers. She received her PhD in communication science and disorders from Northwestern University, then did an MA in neuroscience at the University of California, San Francisco. And she's also invented and patented Choice Compass and is the author of The Calling, as well as co-author of Transcendent Mind, Rethinking the Science of Consciousness, um, and also The Premonition Code. So I'm, I'm delighted to be able to welcome you, Julia, to give your talk. So your talk is, is entitled, How Do Precognition and Other Perceptual Anomalies Shed Light on Models of Consciousness, Unconsciousness, and Time? Over to you, Julia. So thank you, everyone, uh, for listening and also to the Essentia Foundation and Bernard for inviting me. I'm excited. I love what the Essentia Foundation does. And this particular issue of time and mind is, of course, near and dear to my heart. So um, Tupperware, I am really interested in what we can learn from what women have done for a long period of time, which is sort of take care of the home. There's a new uh, Apple TV show called Lessons in Chemistry about a chemist who's a woman who starts a TV show about her own um, experiences making meals, but she does it through a chemical lens. And so I was thinking about Tupperware and what that has to do with science. And I realized Tupperware is like an ancient and useful tool for theory making. Uh, here's what I'm talking about. This is a standard sort of cabinet full of Tupperware. When you look in the cabinet and you're trying to find the right Tupperware for your for your leftovers, you're always asking, what is the right container for these leftovers? So in our context as scientists, what is the right theory for these observations? And then the next question is, how much can we fit into this container? How much can we explain by this theory? The problem, of course, with Tupperware, the limiting factor, as everyone knows who has worked in a kitchen and had to find container that worked with a lid that fits is what do the available lids, which are really the limiting factor, 
really the these are the edge cases of any scientific venture. Tell us about the right container or theory. In other words, we have to find the lid first. We have to find the edge cases first to really inform the theory. And so while there is a lot of taboo around looking at edge cases in science, it's it should be the opposite. We should first attack edge cases in our understanding so that we can understand what a theory might actually be. So this, I believe, what happens when you forget to examine the edge cases with respect to your theory and you just keep detailing out sort of how much spaghetti you can fit into a container, how many, how many observations you can fit into a given theory that's already sort of agreed upon, I think you have a decrease in innovation over time. And this is an article from uh, Nature, January 2023, talking, they, they uh, sort of invented a new measure of scientific innovation, scientific uh, disruption. And they, they named it the, the CD index. And um, you can see over time it's dropping. That's the basic point in both papers and patents. You could argue with their index. But I think it's pretty clear that there, for various reasons um, that are not well understood, but obviously there's multiple components of this, but there's a drop in uh, disruptive technology, disruptive discoveries. I think a piece of it has to do with forgetting that we're supposed to be looking at the things that we're afraid to look at. We're supposed to be looking at the edge cases that actually make us question our theories. So here in the situation where we're trying to look at time and the mind, which are two very um, not well understood or defined areas, at least in the world of science and the world of psychology and physics, uh, I'm sorry, philosophy of physics, they're, they're much better defined. But in sort of the world I'm in, which is mostly neuroscience um, and a little bit of physics, they're not, they're not well defined and there's arguments. I think we have to enter into what I want to call edge science, which is looking at the edges. And we just heard from Alex who referred to the edge consciousness research, and this is exactly the same thing. This is the edge science of consciousness. Um, and I love this wood prints of sort of what we're trying to do here is look at beyond what the theory, what the current theory is going to hold to see what we can actually discover. So I, I think that what that means is we need to ask again some old questions with new eyes. Um, so here are three examples of questions that are really on the edge of our theories of, of mind. The last one is specifically about time. So can mind directly influence matter? So recently, uh, Morris Friedman up at Baycrest wrote his, I believe, third paper uh, showing that frontal areas seem to um, be a filter for the capacity to use the mind to influence matter remotely. So psychokinesis, right? This thing we call psychokinesis in this world. Um, very far out, uh, very impressive work by a neurologist who is, uh, has, I think, a decent amount of rigor. There's a link to it there. By the end, I'll give you a QR code that has a link to this entire slide deck so you could get all these URLs yourself if you want to explore them. Another question is, does consciousness survive death? So in the book that I wrote with Iman Sparus, Transcendent Mind, that came out from American Psychological Association in 2017, we asked that. What, that's a big part of that book is this question of what's the evidence that um, consciousness actually survives death. And so that tells us a lot about our theories of mind, body, and brain. And then, of course, for the past 15 years or so, I've been focusing on the question, maybe longer at this point, um, I've been focusing on the question, can we predict future events that should be unpredictable? And there's a bunch of papers in that at that URL, if you really get interested in that. I'm gonna be focusing on that, but just keep in mind that these are all edge science questions. These are all edge consciousness questions that uh, really define, the answers to which really define our theories. And we, be, we ought to be looking at all of them and more. Okay, so this is a quote from Jimena Canales um, from yesterday's talk that I just, that struck me. I hadn't heard it before and it was explaining some more deeply about where Einstein was um, in his thinking about the now. And it, to me, it answers this question is, what is the edge case, the, the question of what is the edge case when it comes to the relationship between psychological and physical reality? 
So here's the quote. Einstein said that the problem of the now worried him seriously. He explained that the experience of the now means something special for people, something essentially different from the past and the future, but that this important difference does not and cannot occur within physics. That this experience cannot be grasped by science seemed to him a matter of painful but inevitable resignation. So I think that what Einstein was seeing was that this question of the now is the edge case when it comes to understanding the relationship between psychological and physical reality. That is the lid of the Tupperware. If you can find this lid, if you can find the understanding of this relationship, you can define a lot in this theory. So, so Einstein, I believe, and, and you know, ask Mena if I'm right, because this is what I believe based on my much li more limited understanding, was struggling with that because he was seeing, and others, other philosophers and scientists have also seen this, but he was seeing sort of in the now, these questions that we still struggle with. Specifically, what, what is the job of scientists? What are scientists supposed to do? Are they supposed to describe physical reality? Are they supposed to describe perceived or, con uh, or conceived, that should have a D, reality? Are they supposed to describe how we perceive, conceive reality with our senses or imaginations like, like neuroscientists do? Is that what scientists are supposed to do? And you can see the history of science kind of went through, is going through these steps trying to figure out what it's supposed to do. I think physicists would say they're supposed to describe physical reality, but as we just heard from Paul, Paul, when, when you talk about, um, we don't see that the egg goes uh, from a broken state to a whole state. We don't see that. So it sounds like what you're saying is we're, you want to describe what is perceived rather than physical reality itself. So it, it's, it's, it's really, it's a tricky question. Um, then this other question that's related is what does this mismatch between physical and psychological reality, specifically characterized by the now, mean? Does it mean physical reality is secondary? We've been talking about that as, as kind of a form of idealism, that psychological reality is secondary, a form of physicalism, or that physical and psychological realities arise from a third process or substance, some kind of neutral monism. Um, these are you know, time-worn questions that all seem to come, as other people have pointed out, from this mismatch with the now. So what do we know about human experience, um, we know that it feels like the top, where people land on the moon and you don't know what's going to happen next, and then at some point 9-11 happens, and then you don't know what's going to happen next, and then COVID happens, and then of course flying cars, right? We expect that. We don't know if actually that will happen, probably. On below, we have another model, which is this sort of model of, I think similar to what Paul was talking about, where all the events are there. I mean, it's a muddlescape, I agree, but it's this idea that all the events are there in time, like a landscape of time, and human experience is moving across it. So the way I think about time is more like the bottom, but the future is, of course, there you have, you know, of course, a lot of shared information between the past and the future, and human experience moves across it. That also allows for, potentially, it seems like it would allow for, to, in a sort of a naive sense, getting information from that future. If it's already there, it feels like there should be a way to get information from it. So what would that be in terms of mental information? That would be something that is called precognition. So precognition in which the answer is known to no, to no one until a future time appears to work quite well. So this is Jessica, a conclusion of a study. She was hired by Congress um, to try to understand precognition and extrasensory perception in the series of remote viewing studies that the US did. She wrote this in 1996. She was the American Statistical Association president in 2016. She's at UC Irvine. She's a collaborator and a, and a friend of mine. And she told me and has told others that when she gave a talk at her presidential address uh, to these statisticians in 2016, she asked them, look, I, I am convinced that the data on precognition are the strongest of any extrasensory perception data. It's very clear that if, if precog to her, she said it's very clear if the data for precognition were the data for a new drug, you 
you would believe that the drug worked. So she says, so I'm going to ask a room full of statisticians, what would you like to have to be convinced about precognition? Would you like more data? Raise your hands. Okay. Would you like to have a strong personal experience? Raise your hands. The statisticians uh, in a vast majority wanted a strong personal experience. So they work on statistics, which is about trying to make inferences about the world based on data that occurs to a bunch of different people or a bunch of different data points of which they don't have a personal experience. That's their job. And yet what they require to believe that precognition is real is a strong personal experience. Super fascinating. Um, meanwhile, I'm trying to give you a, a personal experience through, I guess, um, through me to let you know that the, there are existing applications of precognition. One of the ways we manage personal experiences that can't be had by everyone in the moment is to talk about how that experience or mental skill is being applied. So um, I can tell you all these things are happening because I have a team of, of people who are skilled precognitives that I've vetted who do these things. So um, supporting unbiased and insightful strategic intelligence. So it's unbiased because they don't know actually what they're looking at. It's in the future. Um, inspiring technical innovations in climate science, addressing complex strategic questions in cryptography, and directing creative engineering in energy research and development. So these things are going on uh, to interesting effect in the sense that they are making teams and people more productive and more accurate about their foresight. Um, so I'm going to lead you through a little better understanding of what I'm talking about and put it in a context of helping us understand what this would even tell us about time in the mind. So there are many different kinds of precognition and I put them on these axes, these axes. So the X axis is precognition with short lead time on the order of milliseconds to seconds. In other words, the time between knowing about a future event and then the feedback of what that event is, is very short and a long lead time, like minutes to years. I predict something that happens minutes, months, years from now. There's also this axis, the y-axis of how conscious you are as a, as a person of the content. So most of the really short time frame stuff you'll notice is unconscious. Most of the longer time frame stuff is conscious. And I'm really focused on precognitive remote viewing these days. Although originally when I started my career in this area, I focused on the other edge, which is presentiment, the really shortest uh, physiological precognition time frame. So um, this is, by the way, from a paper that came out in the Journal of Anomalous and Exceptional Experiences this year. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to call precognitive remote viewing indirect precognition and presentiment direct precognition, and I'll explain why. But I'll explain why in a second, but first I want to go through the differences between them. I think these are edges of a phenomenon. I think there's different mechanisms that that master these kinds of skills. And I think you could be skilled in one without being skilled in the other. In fact, I, I know that's the case. So there are these differences between them about, first, I already talked about whether they're mostly conscious or not. Um, in terms of the time frame. I've already talked about that. There's clarity that um, gender does not influence accuracy uh, for the, what I'm calling indirect precognition or precognitive remote viewing. Um, and it looks like it's influences accuracy for presentiment. Feedback is required for presentiment, but not for precognitive remote viewing. That's a big piece that will come up later. Um, interesting targets seem to help with uh, precognitive remote viewing. Uh, there's evidence, at least from my work, that they're not necessary for presentiment. And there's a sense of self-transcendence or being able to connect with something larger than yourself that um, at least we know uh, in the expression of self-transcendence, it's called unconditional love. We know that when people are experiencing unconditional love, we have I have two data sets showing that uh, we have better precognitive remote viewing, and we don't have that, that those data for presentiment, so I don't know what the answer is there. So to explain why I'm calling one direct precognition and one indirect precognition. For direct pre precognition, you can imagine, especially physicists like to imagine, including Daniel Sheehan, who um, I think has this, this model. He's at University of San Diego and is a collaborator of mine. He has something called the 
what I, what I term the physical time symmetry model. And the physical time symmetry model says, you know, uh, direct precognition is just your future self. So there's something physiological about the future state that trickles back in time and you can pick up on in the past state. Um, and the interesting feature of the physical time symmetry model is the person who experiences the future event has to be the one who predicts it. And they will, they will, they will predict what they experience, even if that's not accurate, right? So there's stories, Eric Wargo talks about this model also called the time loop, he calls it time loops. Um, so there's stories about people who precognize the incorrect number of people dying in a plane accident. And then the newspaper comes out with the incorrect number of people. And so that seems to explain that, right? That's pretty compelling, at least in that one instance, right? It's pretty compelling. And there are ways you can play with uh, experiments uh, in terms of controlled, controlled laboratory experiments to even test this. So I, I believe that that kind of precognition exists. And this indirect precognition, which I think is exemplified by precognitive remote viewing, um, I think is taking place under a different model, which I call the pervasive universal consciousness model. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you um, some nice cones, space-time cones in a second to sort of further explain this. But the indirect precognition, you see it, I don't know if you could see my arrow, but it's starting somewhere out here. This is the experience of the person through the timescape. Um, it's starting outside of that. So you don't have to, while well, the person can experience the future event, they don't have to at all to get the information. And somehow it's floating around and doing whatever. And the information finally comes to the person over here. So this speaks to this, this phenomenon not having to have feedback. The person never has to have the future experience to get the information, which is extremely common in remote viewing applications. So if you're working, for instance, for a law enforcement agency or an intelligence agency who does not want to, nor can they legally give you any feedback about what you have predicted because you don't have a clear answer, you don't have the need to know, um, you can still get the information. And therefore it can't be this model, it can't be that your future self is telling you because you don't know in the future. So you never have that experience and yet you can get the information and be accurate. So how is that? So how is that is what I was puzzling over when I came up with these two models, the physical time symmetry model and the pervasive universal consciousness model. This is also in that same paper in JAEX. Um, so here's the physical time symmetry model. Here's the light cone. You know, as we just uh, heard from Paul and others, so I hopefully don't need to review this, but you'll see that this is here and now. And this arrow shows the information traveling from the future to the past and vice versa. So that's easy to understand. You just have to kind of reverse the arrow of time in some, in some kind of way that we don't understand. I'm not saying that's easy, but I'm saying it's easy to understand. Here we have these different options where information can be coming from completely outside your light cone on the edges to another edge in a symmetric or asymmetric way. Notice the way that I think about these light cones. A physicist might say, well, if you don't get feedback, but the feedback is possible, it might be here in the light cone. If your path is here, it might be over here. You just never get to it. The way I conceive of these light cones is that anything that's in the light cone, because I think conceive of space as and time as already written, like everything calculated all at once, sort of like a Lagrangian all at once kind of calculation. I don't see that anything that is going to happen for you is within this time cone. And I can get into that later. But anyway, that's what that's the way I explain it. The reason I call it the pervasive universal consciousness model is because there can be without your without individual effort, there can be information that arrives to you in the here and now, seemingly from a personal universe, like information specifically for you, like in a dream, you wake up with information. And when I say you, I mean, like, this has happened to me, this has happened to people I've studied. The information that tells you about a future event, like, you don't know why you have, but now you have it. And it wasn't your goal to go get it. So it was like, it feels like, feels like it was the intention of the universe. It feels personal to you. And now it's your information. 
So it's very different than the physicalist model of the universe and actually different from sort of an informational theoretic model of the universe. And yet it does relate, this intention piece does relate between the human um, psychological and the physical. So I, I haven't figured all that out. It's all very questionable. But these are this is the way I'm thinking of it anyway. So what are the implications for theories of mind of these two models? Well, they're, they're different implications, and I think they're both... They all, both sets of implications are important. So for direct precognition, I haven't even covered any of the data showing that these exist. So you just either have to trust me or think that I'm lying um, or you go read those papers. But assuming that you trust me that this exists and there's something here to explain, direct precognition suggests that physiological processes are time symmetric, retrocausal, causally ambigu ambiguous in some way, or that and or that mental processes are time symmetric, retrocausal, causally ambiguous in some way. So, you know, whatever we're talking about, whether it's physicalism, idealism, some kind of neutral monism, or dual monism, whatever's in there has to be some has to have some kind of retrocausal or causally ambiguous or time symmetric substrate. Um, that or that potentially that time loops inform everyday awareness and perception. In other words, there might be unconscious time loops. In other words, if our consciousness might be, if we're receiving it like a radio um, receiver, it might be transmitted from the future. So this is one weird way that, that precognition could influence thinking about consciousness. Okay, indirect precognition suggests the universe may be personal and that intention has causal influence. So it's my intention to of all the events in the world when I'm doing a remote viewing tasking with my team, that we pick out the information that's appropriate for something that we don't know what it is in the future. So we're just setting the intention to get the correct information from the future, and we don't know what that information is. So the fact that that can actually work suggests that intention has causal influence that we don't understand. Um, there is an informational substrate for all events that underlies space-time. That's one, that's one implication. I happen to think it's true, so I listed it there. Um, and that non-local influences on human perception, thought, and action have to be accounted for because this, this, you know, because I have data showing that this works, and I believe my own data, and other people have data, like Mark Whitman, who did a great study on that feedback. Feedback is not required. Um, there's something that needs to be explained in our theories there. So, um, some people like to download slides. So there's that QR code in the right-hand corner will allow you to download all these slides and that will also get you all these links. You can also take a screenshot of this if you're interested. That's me in the upper right-hand corner with my Generation 2 uh, quantum time machine, which I'm sure you'll read about if you're interested. And I just want to thank everyone here, the uh, Bernard especially, and the Time and Mind crew. They were very professional, even though I was sleepy. And um, all the precogs that I've worked with, including the intuitive force casting team, the clients that I've worked with, and the experimental participants, donors, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Bial Foundation, the Jim and Christina Grody Hummingbird Fund, and Jeff Olsner, and then a bunch of recent co-authors to whom I am grateful and uh, have been grateful and will always remain grateful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Julia. And uh, it's... Uh, I, I didn't ever anticipate that, that Tupperware would come into this discussion, but it's a, it's a very useful, a very beautiful analogy. And uh, obviously you haven't had time to describe all the, the data for precognition, but you, you gave the list of your books and I can highly recommend people consult those for further information. Um, I, I also have to say, although I shouldn't be focusing on my own theories, that I, I like this idea of the time loops because it very much relates to my own concept of specious present, which I talked about, because the idea being that the specious present is normally, you know, a tenth of a second or whatever, but that it can expand in certain circumstances. And the point is, within the specious present, there is no distinction between past, present, and future. But anyway... Well, and music. I mean, yeah. Paul brought up music in terms of the expansion of the, of, of the moment. And I think that that's an interesting... Um, idea. Like, I wonder if you could have better direct precognition if you were playing a piece of music, right, all the way through the process. So yeah. I, I can't resist following up that comment because I'm fascinated where people like Mozart would hear their own symphonies 
And if one believes in precognition, it's always seemed to me Mozart creates a symphony, it's played in the future, and if it's a premonition, he can hear his own symphony, and that then generates the, the, the symphony. So you have a sort of creativity being associated with the time loop too. I don't know whether that accords with... Well, and there's, and there's octopus that just escaped to the ocean, like... Right. How did this octopus figure out that it could get through its cage, go down to the floor, crawl across the floor and get to a pipe that would lead to the ocean? Maybe its future self in this kind of direct precognition, it was just following its future self, right? It's just very interesting. I don't know if you read about that. I was I, well, actually, I hadn't heard about the octopus, but I'll certainly read about it later. Now, we've already got several hands up. I think, I think Paul was first. All right. Th thank you. Uh, thank you, Julia. Um, I uh, said earlier that I'm an open-minded skeptic for the paranormal, uh, but the uh, aspect of the paranormal I'm most skeptical about is precognition, because I want to know where are all the precognited billionaires, uh, that uh, if you're a day trader, you can trade on the stock market within a fraction of a second, you don't have to see very far ahead, and you don't have to get it right every time, uh, a 1% advantage, uh, and you will very soon become extremely rich. Same if you go to Las Vegas and, and play roulette. Just just a slight bias will make you immensely wealthy, immensely quickly. So uh, uh, are we to really suppose that all these people with precognitive abilities have never thought, well, I'm going to make a buck out of this? Let me turn it around for you, Paul. Um, why do you assume that the billionaires uh, that have made their money on the stock market aren't precognitive? <laughs> well, uh, I thought you were probably going to say that. Uh, I, I've never had any of them claim that there's anything paranormal about their... Uh, they, why would they do that? As soon as you claim that, <laughs> that you have the capacity to make money on the stock market, um, you get bothered a lot by people. And if you have billions of dollars, you have no reason to do that. You just make your money and then you go change the world according to the way in which you... Right. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> could, could I also, uh, they want to hog this, but make... Uh, an another comment, um, and I said yesterday that you can uh, tell that how old I am because I keep referring back to uh, people and events from a long time ago. Um, but uh, somebody who's been in this uh, game of the paranormal over many, many years, uh, Rupert Sheldrake. I haven't heard his name come up, uh, and I mention it only because I'm very fond of Rupert. I've known him his whole career. Uh, I don't agree with very much he says, but I think uh, I enjoy uh, talking to him a lot, um, uh, where I think uh, he is uh, unfairly maligned is that he does uh, propose experimental tests all the time. And the one thing that drives physicists crazy is when people will just talk about this or that uh, uh, you know, paranormal phenomenon without saying how we suppose, you know, give me a meter that will measure this. Uh, mm. you know, let's try and uh, pin it down. But the group has been very good. Uh, so, for example, in his uh, claim that people know when they're being stared at. You know, it's easy enough. You just get a bunch of students in a row and everybody stares at one of them. And actually, his experimental methodology for that was horrible and was, um, I mean, I love Rupert too, but like he, st he started it with that kind of methodology that had a bunch of sensory leakage. And uh, that was corrected uh, in collaboration with some other folks at Institute of Nautic Sciences. Hmm. So um, I didn't talk about any of my experiments today because I wanted to talk about the ideas and how they shaped uh, the thinking around the mind. Um, but yes, I've given many talks about the experimental evidence for precognition. You can look up those papers and you can read about them or you can watch the talks, but um, yeah. I should do that, thank you. Yep. Ju Julia, just to qualify something, when you talk about billionaires possibly using precognition, uh, you're, would you be arguing that it's unconscious, that they wouldn't themselves know they were using precognition? It could be conscious, it could be unconscious on the level of the timing of a day trader. It might be unconscious because it's such a short time frame. Mm. On Do the any other claim hand, there's this great conscious? study. Mm. There's a great study of uh, interoception uh, for London day traders who survived, basically did mm. well, mm. and uh, they had better uh, interoception, which I think is really interesting, ability to de detect the heart rhythm, mm. which suggests that maybe they could make the unconscious conscious. And so, uh, I think, I think for a lot of people who are skilled at this, the dividing line between unconscious and conscious is much more permeable. Mm. And so um, there's a lot of fluidity. And that may be the same tr uh, truth for creative geniuses, uh, uh, artists, 
musicians, those who let that information bubble up and they're oh, there's the information and they're not so worried about where it came from. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Alex, you have your hand up. Oh, yes, I, I had a question related to polls. So, so Julia, it's hard enough to convince ourselves that we're doing the experiment right and that we're finding it is what it seems to be. And I would like to have more comments from you about this, this avenue I haven't explored yet, which I think you mentioned patenting, right? So rather than trying to convince oneself and then the community, which is hard enough, well, one can say, well, look, I'll make something. And if it works, not only if it's sold, because you can sell things that don't work, but if it works, yes. then it just, it'll just become viral. It will conquer the world. And then who cares if the grumpy skeptic um, doesn't believe it? It will be out there. So, so what can you say about that strategy? Yeah, this is what I call the edge science application strategy. And so because when you're working on edge science, the culture right now suggests that, that it's weird or creepy or taboo rather than like the most important thing you can do to try to understand what's going on in the universe, um, which is, of course, my bias, um, is to just create applications. And so I, one of the things I'd like to do is build a national, for the United States, build a national edge science institute where we do research and a lot of applications around edge science. So just, you know, for instance, I'm working on a quantum time machine. I, I worked with uh, Daniel Sheehan and some other uh, physicists on creating a quantum time machine meeting last year in San Diego. We got a bunch of people from around the world who, mostly physicists, but some philosophers, um, some neuroscientists working on how to send information back in time and had a bunch of working groups. It was invite only meeting in case you haven't heard of it. That's why. So, these kind of applications, so of course I'm passionately pursuing that, but there's other applications like um, I think the folks at IONS are pursuing a mental switch. So changing a, like a, a basically a, a binary switch with the mind, what you need to do to be able to do that. And I think Patrizio Trisoldi is working on the, I think these are things that I know publicly, so I'm saying them, they're out there in the world. Mm -hmm. And then there's other things that I hear about that are not public. Um, but there are plenty of people pursuing the applications approach. And I think that's just the way to go. It's like people who didn't believe GPS would work, you know, whatever, just make GPS. I, I know it's often said that no one will believe in, in, in these paranormal powers until someone can make it a device which will make someone a billionaire from marketing it. Yes. And, and people talk about this as if it hasn't already been done, mm. right? Because their assumption is that when it gets done, people will want to sell it. Mm. So if I were a billionaire and I made a lot of money on one of these devices, would I want to sell? What would motivate me to sell this device to other people? Mm. But, but could I just interject again? So Julia, if you have um, you know your star performer, a student in the lab who uh, is getting slightly above chance with the Zener cards or what you know whatever is the preferred method these days. Um, uh, you know, just say, right, okay, well, let's see if we can fund the Institute of Noetic Sciences by uh, using your talents to uh, in invest. Uh, I mean, that would, I, that would be very convincing if you if you didn't take somebody who was already a, a proven uh, in investor. You took just took somebody uh, who uh, do, you could do a control with uh, one of the students who who wasn't any good at pre Yeah, so your assumption there, you're right. Convincing. Right. Your assumption there is people who are precogs are also going to be good at investing. I have a team of precogs who are excellent. We worked with an investor. The inv we told the investor what to do. He did not listen to our advice. We were right about what happened to the stocks. He was wrong and he didn't make money. So he, he fired us. We quit. So um, there's there's all sorts of human factors here. And we don't understand how genius works. We don't understand how successful uh, prediction works among those people called super forecasters. IARPA had a whole study about super forecasters who predict future events really well. We don't understand if they're using precognition. In other words, we're not asking these questions and we're making the assumption that if you knew you were precognitive, first of all, if you knew you were precognitive and it was conscious, second, you would want to tell other people. In this culture where people are constantly saying you're crazy if you say this, and, and in this culture where there's competition around money and resources, I just don't understand what's going to motivate you to tell other people that in that context. Mm. Um, well, you're making it sound like a conspiracy theory, which mm. is uh, pushing it a notch. 
for me, further in the direction of skepticism. Not at all. Only, mm. only in the sense that um, if you consider culture a conspiracy, in which case, mm. yes, everything's a conspiracy because um, we're all in culture. <laughs> Okay, now um, I, I think I'm going to have to end the discussion of Julia's presentation. I, I would just like to thank you once again, Julia. I'm, I'm so glad you you emphasize the importance of edge science, as indeed did Alex, because it's a fact from the whole history of physics that it's it's those phenomena at the edge. It's the it's the little anomalies which ultimately always lead to the paradigm shifts. And so it's, you've been talking about a particular type of anomaly, but I think it's, it has a message for, you know, science as a whole. So thank you very much indeed, Julia. Thank you. And, and thanks uh, to all the... And all I, the appre I appreciate that uh, we didn't actually have any questions from the floor for this talk, but we're now going into the general panel discussion, so there will be an opportunity to do that. So uh, can I, could I have on the screen everybody who is here present, because I can see Julia, Mark and Paul and Alex and Jimena is... Uh, does that mean that George is not there? George, if I you're there, if you're not there, if you're there, George, could you answer? And if you're not there, you better not answer. Okay, George so is not there. That, that is I relevant because, that. of course, uh, in this panel discussion, the audience will be asked, will make direct questions to the speakers for the whole meeting over the last two days. But bear in mind that actually the only person from yesterday's session presence is, is Mark and myself. Now, uh, there oh, are going Jimena. to a, be a combination of comments, both discussion among yourselves as the speakers and also from the floor. Um, I, I'm going to start off with, with a question to Mark from the floor because it comes from Bernardo, who behind the scenes has been <laughs> playing such an important role in this meeting. So I'm giving him priority coming in before any of you. Uh, to Mark from Bernardo, you argue that experience requires an extended present moment, such as in hearing melodies. But the previous notes in a melody exist only in so far as memories experience right now. So aren't your empirical observations telling us precisely the opposite, that extension requires experience, not experience extension? So that's a, uh, quite a difficult question. So yeah, I don't know actually if I understood it. <clears throat> of, uh, of course, you can always say that. So what I want to say is that um, let's say if you are uh, listening to a melody, uh, um, let's say best example perhaps Dan Lloyd, the philosopher's example of the Hey Jude um, uh, by the Beatles. Um, so, of course, you could say, um, once we're hearing after the hay, we hear the jude, you could say, okay, the hay is already in in the past. Uh, but what I would argue for, what the phenomenologists have argued for, and what you also partly can show in brain science is uh, that we always hear uh, these ex extended melodies, phrases, uh, as chunks as a whole. Uh, so even anticipation. So if we know uh, the the song, when we listen here to when we hear "Hey," we're already imagining the Jude. That is, of course, from coming up from memory, and then it is anticipation of the Jude. And once we are, let's say, physically hearing Jude, we still have this "Hey." Technically speaking, you could say, but that's already physically in the past. But psychologically, experientially, we still hear it as a whole. So we have this "Hey Jude." So this is sort of so that's why I would argue uh, that it is some sort of an experiential extended now, and that's what why I try to define it uh, as an extension of two to three seconds, and not particularly as a memory feature. Yeah? I hope it's some sort of uh, come came close to an answer to what the question was. I, I think so, but doubtless you have a chance to discuss it a greater length later. Um, Julia, there's a question for you from Jonathan. Now, is, 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 that, a, is that our own Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Schooler? Yeah. Ah, Jonathan, we can't see you in the screen. So, of course, uh, it, uh, it's delightful that you are, you are here. 
Um, I don't know if you can somehow appear on the screen, but if not, your voice is quite sufficient. It's very early in California. He might be oh, in my pajamas. goodness. You've got early as well, Jonathan. <laughs> you got up early yesterday as well. It's so. OK. We don't want to see Jonathan in his pajamas. Yeah. OK. So if you're in your pajamas, you, 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 you should stay uh, just the voice. Now, the question anyway to Julia from Jonathan, is there only one future timeline or could there be branches? If there are branches, is it possible to have precognition of a future that does not come to pass? And of course, this is, relates to what Jonathan himself talked about yesterday. So, Julia, how do you react? Yeah, Jonathan, I'm sorry. It's possible that people do want to see you in your pajamas, so I shouldn't prejudge. <laughs> um, but I'm familiar with your nested observers window, um, as you know, I, uh, hypothesis. And I think it's really cool and interesting. And I do, of course, I don't know the answer to whether there's a multiverse and you're traveling, a, uh, you know, into a future line. Um, I do think that what in physics, what retro causality or the idea, you know, Hugh Price and uh, forget the other guy. Oh, Thorne. Yeah. Raymond. Yeah. Say again. Kramer. Price. Cra Hugh Price. And with the Kramer's transactional interpretation. No, I'm thinking of Hugh Price and his yes. co-author who talks. Oh, yes, well, there is yeah, Kramer, Kramer has the transactional interpretation, and then there's the two-state right. vector formalism. Yeah. But I'm separating yeah. that out for yeah, a second. Yeah, no, no, Hugh just sent me his paper with the co-author. So whilst you're talking, I'll look it up. So Hugh, yeah, so Hugh did a paper on. Um, so this now I'm talking to Paul for a second. Hugh, Hugh did a paper on um, on Bell's theorem and how it could be explained. Right. Uh, and the empirical results, how they could be explained by retro causality. And he did that, I think, with someone else whose name I'm forgetting. Well, it's the someone else I'm looking up now. Is it? Okay. Ro uh, no, uh, okay. no uh, Paul, I'm going to ask you to mute yourself just for a second so that I can move forward with the other answer to the question, which is that, thanks, which is that, um, that what retro causality or ambiguous causality buys you in physics is you don't have to explain things using a multiverse. So you don't have to use these branching futures. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have the branching futures if there's retro causality, because God knows nature isn't as elegant as Occam would think that nature would be. But, um, but it, it means that we can get away without it. And so I'm agnostic about that. And so when I think about your nested observer windows, I think, okay, we're living in a world in which we have these branching futures. Uh, we may or may not have retro causality. If we have retro causality and the branching futures, which I think any world description has to contain something like retro causality or ambiguous causality to explain the results already. Um, if we have that, then yes, you could precognize uh, futures that don't happen. On the other hand, um, in, in direct precognition, you would only precognize what happens to you if you were precognizing a future that didn't happen, you would never call it precognition because it didn't happen. So you wouldn't be able to label it as precognition. So it's almost untestable, is, is the idea. For indirect precognition, there might be a label in the future for an event, sort of an intentional label for an event that occurs versus an event that doesn't occur, or an event of more interest versus an event of less interest. And I think that's interesting to look into. All right, Paul, thanks. I'm done with that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's Ken Walton. That's right, Price Excellent. and Wharton. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you so much. They did that paper mm. together yeah. on why retro causality is helpful to explain uh, some. Of um, course, Julia, it, 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 it might be interesting to mention that in the sort of the five-dimensional model where you have a an extra dimension, it, it does allow you to change the future. You you have a future which is fixed at one point, but in your when you get to the next point in the higher dimension, you can change the future, and that was part of the idea of the philosopher C. D. Broad. Yes. Uh, when he, yes. When he was and so this whole, Right. I, I am a huge fan of this idea, and it just feels aesthetically pleasing to me. So I'm not saying there's, I don't, I don't think anyone could defend their, um, their ideas about time mm. in some sort of empirical sense, really. Um, you could say what a theory must require based on empirical data, but mm. at this point, I don't think we can differentiate too much in terms of the theory. But in any case, um, what is aesthetically pleasing to me is this all at once type of calculation where nothing, there's no changing the future. Mm. Well, there's none of that. And so this, this is book, wonderful book called Beyond the Dynamical mm. Universe. It's all about this kind of Lagrangian idea.
Well, I have a question for Alex here, which that again relates to precognition. Um, if memories are stored in time, why can't we remember the future? That's for I Alex, although... Well, I don't know, but again, being a Bergsonian, Whitehead corrects it perhaps, but I like to think about the future as, as creative and, and novelty as being true novelty, not some sort of psychological novelty that just as you move the dial happens to happen to us. And so there's a huge asymmetry in my understanding of the past and memory and perception not being the same thing, but at the same time as, as, as Bernardo was asking before, there has to be some stepping of the past into the present. And I think there's a little bit of, as I mentioned, a little bit of leaking because if time has width, there's, there can be a bit of leaking from the future. But I think beyond that, the future is completely novel. And therefore, um, I mean, otherwise, otherwise, in what kind of universe do we think we're living? I mean, I would throw the question back at, at for instance, at Julia, right? And so everything is, do we have um, free will, for instance, right? And, and is something new really happening at all in, in the universe, let alone in our perception of it. Well, this also I, relates I, to the can question I take of... That? Should I take that or should I ignore that? Mm. Should I take that? <laughs> I mean, this relates to the whole question of the block universe, because, of course, in the block universe picture, the future is fixed, and, and so you can't change it. But, of course, George Ellis, in his talk yesterday, was uh, arguing for the evolving block universe, which, which says the future isn't determined, or, or if it is, it could be changed. So... Um, but, but I don't, I I'm not sure that, how the block universe fits into Julia's picture or indeed to what Paul was saying. But I think, can I just correct? I don't think the block universe says the future is fixed in the sense that uh, everything that happens in the future is determined by the present state of the universe because we do know there's some indeterminism. The future might be there, but not fixed in the sense of predetermined. So yes, but, but nevertheless, it is fixed if you believe the block universe. It may well, not it's be... there, as it were, it, yeah. uh, but I mean, uh, the word fixed bothers me a bit because it does sound like a, a retreat into uh, into determinism or even super determinism has uh, been a, uh, often, often... Well, this is precisely why Paul, some people... Paul, uh, Paul, uh, sorry, Julia, but, over but, to but you. I interrupted you. The question yeah. was to you, Julia, and I'm uh, no, yeah, but, both interrupting. I've got to get on me. But I, you had a great answer. I think that when people talk about when people confused, confuse um, the future being there with the future being predetermined. And and this is this is a big point of confusion. And And the idea of the block universe... Minkowski space time, the future is there, but predetermined based on the past is an assumption based on our idea of the arrow of time. And this is why I'm so into this all at once calculation. So when you say fixed, Bernard, it the, the it sounds it sounds reasonable to you because it's but the problem is that in physics it has been associated with this idea of superdeterminism and predeterminism. And so I think it is it is more clear to say that that those space time events are there. Yes. Um, uh, what and so then, but then we get to the question of free will, and that was kind of the question that Alex was: What kind of universe do we think we live in? I think we live in one in which we are we perceive that we have free will, as as Mark mentioned, we have the experience of free will. Experiences are real, in the sense that we experience them. So we experience that we have free will, in terms of the. The free will question, I think the key question is who are we talking about? So when you say, do we have free will, you're talking about individual I. If you're saying, do I have free will, now you're postulating that there's this I entity. And you're asking a question that's about a non-physical entity because I'm not my body, right? We, we talk about that. What is the relationship between the non-physical entity and the physical block universe? Hard to know, right? That's hard to know. Um, my guess is that the free will question comes from our desire to think that we can control things and that we can make um, whatever's in the future, that we can actually determine whatever's in the future based on the present and the past, because that would be really nice and we would feel like we were in control. And the very fact that we have a bias towards wanting to be in control makes me suspicious that that might not be the case. Well, well if, if I could just comment, I mean, uh, I would argue that 
you can have a concept of free will changing the future if you do have this, this extra time dimension. And the point I'm making is that you can't even have consciousness without this extra time dimension, because in, all, in terms of ordinary four-dimensional space-time, there is no consciousness. And you have to invoke an extra dimension anyway to do that. So once you've got this extra dimension, you, you can open up the possibility of free will. But that picture in itself is not consistent with the standard block universe of Einstein. So to, but anyway, uh, th th we have another question which to Paul, which does actually relate to this, isn't denying the flow of time in some sense equivalent to Barber's denial of time itself? Can you elaborate more on the differences? Yes. Um, well, uh, of course, it's difficult for me to speak uh, for Julian Barber, who has his own uh, particular take, but his, uh, my understanding of how he's arrived at his uh, rather more dramatic uh, position that time does not exist, uh, that it's uh, uh, overall a fiction. I first want to make a distinction between what I said earlier, that time and space might be an e emergent phenomenon. In other words, just like uh, um, the elastic properties of solids emerge from the molecular substructure, so maybe the elastic properties of space-time that we know from general relativity uh, emerge from some microscopic uh, substructure. So that's not what we're talking about. Uh, I think um, uh, that Julian has arrived at his point of view from the subject of quantum cosmology. Now, this is where uh, you take uh, Schrodinger's equation, which will be 100 years old in a year or so, uh, and uh, try to apply it to the universe as a whole in some simplified manner. So you have a wave function, which is supposed to describe everything in the universe. Uh, and then in Schrodinger's equation, if you apply to an atom or something, uh, time appears as a parameter. Uh, so you can talk about how the wave function evolves with time. Now, if you try to do that in cosmology, the time parameter drops out. Uh, it, there's a surrogate. Uh, you can take the size of the universe, take some volume of space, and then it's getting bigger all the time. Uh, and that can replace time in your equation. And so it's very tempting to say, well, we don't, you know, what is this thing called time? We don't need it at all. And that's his position. That's not my position. My position is that uh, time might be emergent, but uh, in any case, it's a real thing. It's what clocks measure, intervals of time, uh, and it's absolutely there. Um, it's like space. Uh, rulers measure distance between points. Clocks measure uh, dis distance and temporal distance between time. Uh, there's the timescape, there's the landscape, there's mm. the four dimensional version of it all, the block universe. Um, and that we need make no reference to time flowing or changing or running or any of these metaphors that people use, except in the, the realm of human affairs and neuroscience and psychology, where it's perfectly appropriate to say we feel time flowing, just like I feel I have free will. Whether I, I do have free will or not, I don't know, but it's a feeling. And uh, if we think science should encompass feelings, then of course we need a scientific explanation for that. I don't think it comes from fundamental physics unless Bernard is right and that we need to append or extend our idea of space and time to incorporate the, the mental realm. And then I'm open to the idea that we, you know, that all this may change. However, Paul, it's, I, it's not necessarily obvious that what happens to space and time at the Planck level, that that in itself is going to elucidate the link with consciousness and the passage of time. You, it, no, you I mean, there are some people who think that that, that, that that is indeed the case. I mean, I think Stuart Hameroff has, uh, from uh, time to time, uh, hinted that, uh, you know, maybe consciousness is to, to be found down at the Planck scale, but I... And, and indeed, yeah. Donald Hoffman. I, for him. I mean, Donald Hoffman likes the idea that consciousness is something to do with the level where space and time were superseded. But right, right. right. Can yeah. I ask you a very uh, direct I'm, question, Paul, yeah. on, on behalf of George, who isn't here, because uh, this is probably a yes or no question. Do you, in your model, in your, in your perception of time, do you agree with the concept of an, of an evolving block, a growing block universe, or do you want to stick to the block universe? Oh, I certainly want to stick to the block universe. That's mm. not to say I'm denying that the universe evolves. It clearly does. It expands, for example. Mm. Uh, and uh, so time is a meaningful thing. It's an important fundamental part of physics. Um, 
and uh, uh, and it's really a question of mm. this myth of passage, uh, uh, as it's called, uh, that I don't think t time is passing at all, mm. as I've been at pains to point out. Mm. Because I'm not denying the existence of time, I'm not denying the fact that the universe evolves, or that there's an arrow of time giving the directionality of that evolution, and it's an arrow like the arrow on a compass needle, it's not the arrow mm that flies through the air. It's not motion, it's direction that okay. it's pointing. I, I think if George was here, he would disagree, but, uh, oh, but he's not here, so... I hope so. Anyway, and by the way, of course, to me, I, I, we welcome disagreements. I think discussions are much more interesting when people have a slightly different points of view. Uh, Mark, I have another question for you. Could subjective time be a measure of the density of qualia? E.g., someone anesthesia, someone under anesthesia experiences the last moment before becoming unconscious, as if it had immediately preceded the moment of waking up, i.e., as if no time had elapsed between the two moments. So, uh, how do you react to that, Mark? Um, I don't know if we have to uh, refer to qualia. That's of course possible, but that's an interpretation. What is qualia? There's a big uh, uh, well quarrel about. Are there qualia or not, or something? Yeah, um, philosophically speaking, but we can uh, refer to um, yeah, let's say sensory perception and memory. In that, it has been shown that, especially in anest anesthesia, people after the way wake up have no sense of time. Yeah? So they wake, wake up, and, and it actually happened once to me. I woke up and I asked, um, has the uh, procedure yet begun? And because I thought I was just had blacked out or something, but actually well, the hours had passed. Um, and, and this is explained that through the anesthesia, uh, cortical um, uh, processes are some sort of uh, down-regulated. And uh, therefore, you have no processing of uh, sensory events. And when you wake up, then there's nothingness, pure nothingness. Uh, and then you think no time has passed, although many hours have passed. Yeah? So you could interpret this in the sense of qualia or uh, a sense of uh, events that you have experienced, uh, which are stored in memory. And this defines also passage of time in looking back. Yes. OK. Um... Well, let's go on to, uh, to another question, which is to you, Paul. Again, under your view, the notion of time travel is either incoherent or trivial in the sense of being what is ordinarily happening now anyway. OK. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, this is, uh, under you, this is a question. Is, is this correct? We couldn't tell that we time travel to the future if we did so tomorrow right. Right, well, it just depends what we mean. I, th I think th th there's a distinction here, obviously, between the normal time travel in the sense that we have a passage through time and the, and the idea of time travel in, in the sense of uh, using time machines, if I understand this correctly. Right, right. well, we're, we're back to, to the muddle scheme, because let me try yes. and unmuddle yes. this. So, mm. And I can recommend a really good book on it. It's called How to Build a Time Machine by somebody called Paul Davis. Oh, um, I, I can recommend uh, that too. <laughs> Um, so we must distinguish, you know, earlier I played this little game, imagine we fell asleep and woke up and we were five years old, but it was, uh, you know, with all your memories and everything, the state of the world as it was, how would anything be different? That's a sort of time travel, if you like, or simply uh, just uh, sitting still and waiting for the future to arrive. If you want to use that terminology, that's a type of time travel. But in physics, uh, we often discuss the possibility of uh, reaching the future quicker. How would you do that? Well, uh, get into a, a spacecraft, travel close to the speed of light and come back again. And uh, if, uh, I think you mentioned this, Bernard, the twins effect. So uh, for you, maybe two years have elapsed in the, in the rocket. Uh, when you get back, 20 years have elapsed on Earth. So you've reached the future quicker by moving. And you can do the same thing by getting close to a black hole. Mm. So in that sense, travel into the future, uh, we know it can happen. It's a done deal. You can measure it. Uh, this is uh, now part of laboratory physics. This is There's no mi mystery about this. It's, re it's a real effect. Going back into the past, however, is a, a much more problematic thing. Um, there's nothing in Einstein's general theory of relativity to prevent it. 
And that's our best understanding of the nature of space and time. It may not be the last word, but if you take that as it is, there's nothing to prevent you, uh, a, a, a particle or an observer, traveling on what we would call a closed timeline curve, uh, which would, uh, in Doctor Who uh, terms, would mean I climb into the TARDIS and press a few buttons and get out, and it would be yesterday or last week. Um, and that raises all these fascinating paradoxes. I meet my younger self, and what happens if I kill my younger self? And it's what makes time travel stories so fascinating. There's nothing in our understanding of um, space-time physics uh, to prevent that. Uh, and uh, but that doesn't mean that it, it, uh, it will happen. It could be that so quantum mechanics, the properties of the quantum vacuum, prevent this happening. So Stephen Hawking introduced what he called the chronology protection hypothesis and the notion that there is a chronology horizon that as soon as you get a space-time structure that might permit this looping back into the past, uh, that uh, the quantum vacuum uh, would get caught up in it and it would um, uh, uh, surge to the point where it would actually wreck that space-time geometry. I think that's entirely likely that that is the case and travel into the past would not be permitted. Mm. Um, I, I think everything I've just said is consistent with the notion that there's no flow or passage of time uh, that you simply go back to some earlier time. It's weird in the sense that you would be visiting an earlier time that was part of your um, uh, part of your past, uh, and so then you get into all sorts of uh, discussions about free will. You know, you go back mm. and you can't change anything inconsistent with the future you've come from. But but people have written at length about that. Uh, David Deutsch, for example, and you, if you have parallel universes, you can you could get around that problem. So I'm not sure I've actually answered the question, uh, but I, I, I've, I've sort of summarised all the different views I, of time travel. I think the comments you made are very, uh, very elucidating. And uh, incidentally, I was amused. You made a reference to Doctor Who, and maybe our American friends don't know about Doctor oh, Who. Yeah, that's Doctor true. Who I is the famous mostly, science actually. fiction character on BBC television. And just by chance, uh, just a few days ago was the 60th anniversary of the first Doctor Who program. So it's a, it's a, a timely reference. Um, I know if, if George was here, I know he would uh, strongly argue against uh, close time like curves, as, as of course did Stephen Hawking by his chronology protection theorem. I have to say though, um, I, I'm rather enamored with closed time like curves, at least on a small on a small scale. I, I even associate consciousness with with closed time like curves. And of course, people have invoked them in the context of quantum theory, you know, with um, retro retro causal effects. So it it seems to me a really interesting question. Obviously, most physicists are skeptical of closed time like curves, but it's not as you yourself said. It's not excluded. It's even allowed by Einstein's equations oh. and uh, I, I personally think this could be quite an important clue, but I might be wrong. But here comes Julia with a, a remark. And we can't hear you, Julia. Julia, we can, we've lost your sound. I have to register a formal complaint just on behalf of all Americans who are scientists or philosophers. There's no way we don't all know who Doctor Who is. And oh I my spent goodness! Hours trying to figure out I the time and mind aspects of Doctor Who. Are you kidding me? Okay, that is my formal complaint. Sorry, we, you'll delete my reference from the recording. Of course, yes. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that Doctor Who gets to America as well as different points in time. Now, oh, that was your 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 comment. Great. Yeah, I should to mention just whilst we're on this topic that Einstein hated the idea of. Uh, to, travel into the past, but his uh, colleague in Princeton, Kurt Gödel, was uh, enamoured of it and uh, indeed produced a solution of Einstein's very own gravitational field equations that has the possibility of travelling from uh, any given point in space-time to any other given point. There is will be a trajectory that mm. joins them, uh, but he had to assume that the universe is mm. rotating. Mm. And uh, Freeman Dyson told me that he took this very seriously. This wasn't just a little bit of, mm. uh, you know, fun that he was having. And uh, he would often ask uh, Freeman, you know, have they found it yet? Have they found mm. the rotation of the universe? Uh, and it was very much part of Gödel's own rather mm. idiosyncratic um, mm. view of the nature of reality. Uh, he, he being logician, f famous for his mm. work on undecidability and so on. He had a, a view of nature that uh, actually 
uh, would be supported by the notion of uh, travel into the past. But of course, Paul, Einstein disliked quite a lot of ideas which later turned out to be correct, such as black holes and the expanding universe and quantum mechanics. Yes, yeah, he certainly hated quantum mechanics. Mm. Thank you. So let's go on to another question. This is to Alex. Why are materialists so rigidly holding on to a paradigm that fundamentally lacks explanatory power with regard to consciousness, intentionality, subjective time, etc.? What motivates them? Well, it worked very well for 400 years, right? So to Caesar, what is Caesar? So as we say in Spanish, al pan pan y al vino vino. It, it, it worked well, and it worked well, I think, because of what I said at the beginning, because Galileo made that move and said, well, let's put this to the side, please. Let's work on this. And this has been fantastic. Now time goes by, and what do we do with this thing to the side? And here we are finally facing those hard problems, uh, but not... And that's my, that was my whole proposal, which wasn't concrete, not in a Galilean way any, any, anymore. We need to change it. Now, this was successful, but I think then it got ingrained. And there are many complex issues here that have to do with theology and, and, and secularism. And, and it's fascinating, like, because that was rejected. I mean, the whole story, right? First, a dualism. Then we have, no, not dualism, just a monism, but it has to be materialistic. And then what do we do with the other thing? And then there's the issue of rejecting the church and God, but then God always comes back in another way in, in the present. And plus, scientists are social beings. We don't reflect on that. And so we're, we're carried away by our own biases. And science progresses low, more slowly than one funeral at a time because people create schools of thought. And yeah. <laughs> and then molecular biology just rocks it in the 20th century, just perhaps betraying everything that the physicists had just understood a few decades before. And then you pour on top of it capitalism and just making machines. And yeah, it's, it's, but it's an, it's an anomaly. It is an anomaly. Um, the science as we know it, as it's practice, it's an anomaly. And all those truths, experiential truths have been known forever in all in, in, in all traditions, except in the West, the last Few hundred years, right? So, so let's, as, as Julia would do, let's put it upside down. Um, may, I, I'm not sure who has the burden of proof here. I think it's the materialist, and it's still, and I, I call it the terminal lucidity phase of materialism because <laughs> in all of these, in all of these consciousness books, they always have to have these neuro celebrities, and I say it with respect again, but with critique, they always have to kick the stone, if you know, kick the stone of. <laughs> All the other isms that it's not their pre preferred ism, and there's a lot of, you know, people believe, and that doesn't. Then there's logical positivism, and then the idea that no, I'm not doing, I don't have a philosophy, I'm only doing science. It's it's a cocktail. It's all mixed. <laughs> We're trying to just put it apart with philosophy, history of science, and 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 all the rest. <laughs> so Alex, it's a long, I'm, it's yeah. a long story, but it yeah. can be, it can be, yeah. it can just one more thing to say, it can be integrated. As we expand, you know, as we expand um, in physics, <laughs> I think materialism has its place. It just, it needs to be in its proper place yeah. and then everything will be fine. So it doesn't need to be a battle where, yeah. you know, two, two men get in and one man gets yeah. out like the movie, you know, just find the right place for materialism yeah. and we'll all be fine. Alex, I loved your reference to the possible terminal lucidity stage of the of materialists and uh, it sort of brought to mind that the idea that in some sense uh, materialism is the filter through which respectable science so often has to be channeled. But, uh, uh, and also I would like to, to say, I mean, I think in my talk I mentioned there is an academy for the advancement of post-materialist science. And it's a minority view among scientists. I, I'm sure most scientists oppose the idea, but it does seem to me that the message of recent developments is that we do need a form of science or even a form of physics which goes beyond what is normally called materialism. And uh, of course, what we mean by matter is anyway very old fashioned, but matter in the classical sense we know is that's not the real view, but beyond physic current physicalism at least. So um, 
I'm, I'm glad that at this meeting we've had an opportunity to voice, to voice that, that, that opinion because I know some people will object to it, but it, it does seem to me that a post-materialist form of science and physics may be necessary. But anyway, I think we're going to uh, have to wrap up now. We've had, uh, we're five minutes over, over, overdue, but I, I think that is, is fine. Um, I was going to ask you if you have any anyone has any final comments, but I think I, I won't do that because that'd be quite a, a long discussion. So I, I would just like to thank all the speakers, including those who, who aren't present at the moment, for, for such wonderful presentations. What I've so enjoyed about this meeting is that, as I, I said in my, one of my slides, it's, it's interdisciplinary. It's brought together people from physics, philosophy, neuroscience, and, and history, and, and, and biology, and psychology. I hope I haven't missed anything out. And, and, and I just think that's so important because it's when you, it seems to me that it's always when you have disciplines interacting that you, you get a broader perception of reality and that tends to lead to progress, to paradigm shifts. And I don't know whether there's going to be a post-materialist paradigm shift, but there's going to be a paradigm shift because there always has been paradigm shifts. And, and I must confess, because I do take, believe in some of these phenomena, I think whatever that new paradigm is, whatever type of toothbrush it is, I do think that it's going to have to accommodate some of these phenomena. But obviously we don't all agree about these issues and that's what's made the discussion so interesting. And, uh, and I would like to say that there will, the recordings of all our discussions over the past two days, um, they will be available on YouTube in due course. I'll see if we can extract my remark about Americans not knowing about Doctor Who. But, but apart from that, I think the recordings will be available in full. And, uh, and that's great because it means many people will be able to benefit from, from this meeting, even if they weren't able to attend. I, I suspect there were quite a number of questions uh, which I didn't get to see, but uh, I'm sure in due course we will be able to get give answers to those questions as well. I'm not sure if they will be recorded, but we'll see if there's a record of them so that we can address those later. And so finally, I mean, it just remains for me to, to, to thank a, a few people, uh, uh, besides obviously the speakers who have been <laughs> center stage. I do, I do want to thank obviously the Essentia Foundation who have hosted this meeting, um, that they, they host the meeting like this uh, every year. I think this is maybe the third or fourth meeting, so there will be further ones. But I also want to, to thank uh, BEX, which is the organization which has been arranging all the logistics, been interacting with you in, in, in arranging times of talks and things like that. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, PJP, which is the organization which is in charge of all the videoing and the re recordings, because without this, none of this would have been possible. So to everybody involved, thank you so much. Um, and, uh, and finally, of course, I would like to thank you, the audience, because without you, there would be no point in, in talking. So uh, we're very grateful and that you're here. And I, we've never, it's rather frustrating never being able to see the audience or the expressions on your faces, but uh, I know you are there. I believe there's been at least 100 people there. And uh, as I say, you're welcome to relive the experience by, by watching the, the recordings later on in YouTube. So it only remains, remains for me to say bye-bye, and uh, uh, I'm sure we'll meet again at some future time. Mm -hmm.